Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the December 7th, 2022 School Committee meeting. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and welcome to all of our guests tonight. We have a full house. For our first item of business, we have our middle school student representatives, Peyton Steen and Nick Iantilli. Can you come on down, please? Thank you. Thank you for being here, and congratulations on ELF. The Wilmington Middle School has been very busy preparing for winter celebrations. We kicked off our winter celebrations by showcasing the many talents of our WMS students. The Drama Club continues to outdo itself with another outstanding performance. The musical Elf hit the WMS days December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd with four outstanding performances. Congrats to Ms. Prindeville and the entire cast of Elf. Middle school chorus students performed along with the WH WHS chorus at the Joanne Benton Auditorium on Tuesday, December 6th. This was a great way to kick off the holiday season and celebrate winter. Students performed songs like White Christmas and Underneath the Tree. The WMS Concert Band will be performing alongside the high school on December 8th. It is always an impressive event to see the Wilmington High School and the Wilmington Middle School Concert Bands playing together. World Culture Club wrapped up November celebrating some of the traditions of the Native American culture. Students listened to traditional music and ate cornbread while they learned about their traditions. Students were also treated to an extra meeting date to watch different countries participate in the World Cup. This was a great opportunity for our students to learn about the most popular sport in the world, 3.5 billion followers, known in most countries as football. The sixth grade will have their annual gingerbread making celebration on Friday, December 23rd. This has been a wonderful tradition that all our sixth grade students look forward to. We cannot wait to see the tasty creations students come up with this year. Student Council con continues to be very busy this time of year. We have planned a spirit week for the week of the 19th to the 23rd. Stay tuned for the upcoming themes. Student Council is also looking forward to our winter decorating event in conjugation with advisory. The students at WMS will be creating snowmen, similar to door decorating, to celebrate and spread the, that winter spirit. Thank you so much you. for letting us know what's going on. Does anyone have any questions? Just a, just a, a sure. comment and congratulations on ELF. I know most Thank of you. us in the room were there. It was outstanding. You guys all did a great job. So Thank you. And we have us. Santa and Mrs. Claus with us. I'm <laughs> trying not to give it away. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you very much. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. And we hope you have a great December. All right. Our <coughs> next item of business that has filled our room tonight with so many students, we have the Athletics Department Fall Review of Wilmington High School Athletics presentation. Uh, Mr. Ingram. Thank you all for having me. All right. We'll get right started here. This is the fall um, athletic review. First off, we have our cheer team, and we have our cheer, cheer team with us tonight. They're the Middlesex League champs. They qualified for the all-state competition. Uh, we have head coach Christina Zuccaro here, assistant coaches Kylie Ballario and Allie Fogg, Tiffany Smith, all, uh, senior all-star, Erin Murray, freshman all-star, and Kelsey McKenzie, junior all-star. And since we have all the girls here tonight, I'd just like to introduce them, and girls, if you just stand and just wave, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, was, I promised them there was no speaking parts. <laughs> Sarah Gillespie. Just stand <laughs> Thank you. Regan Brady. Haley Cunningham. Kelsey McKenzie. Madison Murray. Mary Almas, Isabel Iascone, Isabel Cooper, Emma Chiricello, Lillian King, Maya Lanzi, Lily McLaughlin, Erin Murray. And there was four members of the team not here tonight that I'd just like to mention. <coughs> Tiffany Smith, Emma Erickson, Brooke Gierf, Brooke 
Gifford and Ava T. Burt. Um, excellent season for the girls, and we just wanted to try to promote the outstanding season, the athletes and the coaches, and thank them for taking their time out of their busy schedule to make it down here tonight. Thank you all. Congratulations. Congratulations. <clears throat>Yeah, we can do that, yeah. Okay. So um, on behalf of the school committee, um, Wilmington and the district, we just wanted to say we're so proud of you and thank you for representing our town so well, for your commitment to your sport, but also to academics and the service that you provide um, around town. We're just so thrilled that you're here with us tonight and so proud of your accomplishments. So congratulations. We have a certificate for you, um, recognition and achievement, and we actually thought we could present it to the captains and the captains could actually present it to their coach and the coach could then display it. So. Are our captains so, here or no? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, the next team that we brought along with us tonight <clears throat> is the girls' cross country team. Uh, they were 6 0. They were league champs in cross country that's broken off into the Liberty for large and freedom for the small. Uh, they were the freedom champs. Head coach Joe Patron, assistant coach Brian Shepard. Mallory, Br Mallory Brown was a senior all-star. Hannah Bryson, <laughs> junior all-star. Charlotte Kylie was an eighth grade all-star. And Addison Hunt was the sophomore league MVP. The team qualified for the all-state meet at Fort Devens. Um, and just like we did before, we have the whole team here. So girls, when I call your name, wave, stand up, just acknowledge, please. Um, Captain Mallory Brown, Captain Hannah Bryson, Addison Hunt, Kaylee Israelson, Charlotte Kylie, Mia Strolik, Isabel Zaya, and we have Coach Joe Patron, and he's probably going to kill me for this. Today is Coach Patron's 60th birthday. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> and just like the cheer team, we'd like to thank them for an outstanding season, the coaches, the athletes. Um, spending all the time they did, they, they, it really a successful season. And thank you for taking the time. I know many of the girls on the team also have commitments in the winter with athletics and working that they were able to free up their time to come down. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, well, we actually have another certificate for the cross country team, but I, I love birthdays, so I think it would be so great to sing happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do you all think? Is that good? All right, one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear coach. Happy birthday to you. What a pleasant surprise. I'm I sure know. Coach Patron is feeling the same <laughs> thought right surprise. now. Surprise. Um, girls we do bar mitzvahs too. <laughs> Um, girls cross country on behalf of the school committee and Wilmington, the town, the district, we are so proud of you and it is such a joy to, to witness your successes. We thank you for your service. We thank you for your commitment to your sport and um, for all that you do for our town and for both teams for being such a good representation but also such good role models for, for all the students who are coming up to start their sports. Um, a year or a couple of years from now. So thank you very, very much. If I could have the captains, and then you could present this to your coach. <laughs> thank you very much to both teams and coaches for coming down. We really appreciate that. Uh, moving on to the rest of the teams in the fall, uh, boys soccer. Had a record of 3, 11, and 4. Head coach Steve Scanlon, JV coach Christopher Greco, JVB coach Jared Constantino. Ryan Wilson was a senior all-star. Remy Elliott was a junior all-star. Uh, the picture we have here is the team and coach celebrating his 700th career varsity win. That's for multiple sports. It's for hockey and soccer. Um, I asked him to say something nice, and he said, it just means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, they, they made it to the state tournament, and they lost to Linfield 3-2. to two. We have girls soccer. They finished with the record 6-6-7. Six, six, and seven. Head coach Sue Hendy, JV coach MJ English, and assistants Shane Kligerman and Chris Frasori. Colleen Baldy was a senior all-star. Molly McDonald was a junior all-star. 
Ashley Mercier was a junior all-star. Jill Collins was a sophomore all-star. Uh, they qualified for the state tournament and had a preliminary game against Comhurst High School, which is way out in Springfield. They won that game 8-0, to zero, and then and they advanced to Danvers and lost 2-0. to zero. Mm -hmm. Coach Hendy is retiring after 35 seasons coaching girls soccer here at Wilmington High School. I believe she retired from teaching three or four years ago and 324 wins. So, so quite a career there and quite a send off for Coach Hendy. Field hockey, field hockey finished with a record of five, 12 and one. Head coach is Leanne Ebert, JV coach is Laura Connors. Assistant is Catherine McKenna. Abigail Hassel was a junior all-star. Ava DeFiorio was a junior all-star, and Karina O'Donnell was a senior all-star. Uh, the girls made it to this, qualified for the state tournament, and in the preliminary, they hosted East Bridgewater, and it was one of the most amazing games I've ever seen. It went three overtimes <laughs> with no score, and then it went to a shootout um, in field hockey, and they won by one. It, it, it was pretty amazing to watch. They moved on to Gloucester, and they lost four to one. That ended their season. The golf team, um, <clears throat> they finished their season with a 0-11 and record. Head coach Steve Lynch, who's also retiring. Um, they had a league all-star, Patrick Stokes, who's also a senior. Girls volleyball here, great picture here. They do um, a dig <coughs> pink night where they raise <coughs> a ton of money. They finished with a 4-16 and record. Head coach is Lauren Fletch Donahue, JV coach Madison Burke. JVB coach Heather Lawsley. Maddie McCarron was their lone all-star senior, who I believe is continuing to play at Endicott next year. Boys cross country, coached by Coach Patron, the birthday boy. They finished with the two and four record. The assistant coach Brian Shepard and Dean Champa was the senior all-star for the boys cross country. The football team had an overall record of two and 10. Pictured here is Coach Craig Turner, um, this picture took place when they played at Barricka. The game was at 7 o'clock. I think 2 o'clock that morning, Coach Turner gave birth to his second child. And it was just a wild and emotional day. And Coach Turner is originally from Barricka. So at the end of this game, the, whole, the coaching staff and whole team from Barricka came up to the coach in the team and presented him with a game ball for his newborn son. It was, it was quite a nice moment. Very, very surreal and very... Um, it was non-scripted. It was just nice to kind of see it developing. His assistant coaches are Thomas Shield, Sean Turner, Raleigh Hinkle, and Charlie Turner. Um, he had two all-stars, Dempsey Murphy, a junior, and Michael Lawler, a junior. We had two um, national letter of intent signings that we'd like to highlight. One was Tiffany Smith, who was part of the cheer team. She signed her NLI to attend Quinnipiac University to be a member of the acrobat and tumbling team. Here we have a picture with Tiffany, her parents, her family, her coaches, some teachers and friends in there. And we also had Nate Alaberti to sign his national letter of intent um, to go to St. Aslam's College for men's lacrosse. And here's a picture of Nate, his parents, and his teammates. We had a third one that we could not, um, we have a girl who, who actually doesn't play for, we don't have a fencing team, but she plays on a club fencing team, and she got a Division I scholarship to Temple. And at, at, she's having a tough time organizing all of her people, and she wants to have some gear there as well. So um, at some point, we will be recognizing her, but we have not forgotten about her. Also, something that happened this fall with athletics, um, there was an induction to the Hall of Fame. This is the picture here of the two, class of 2022. It's a rather large class. It's not normally this size, but the Hall of Fame committee missed a cycle due to the pandemic, so they tried to make up for it by um, having twice the enrollment in, in the induction class. Pictured here are uh, former Wilmington High School athletes with their graduation year, and we have one coach, Coach Mike Pimentel, who also taught here for maybe 15 years in the phys ed department. Two back-to-back -back state championship hockey teams were recognized. I think between the two teams, we had like 35 to 45 of the players down there. So it was a real nice night to celebrate all the, um, the special athletes and the teams. Okay, Willie the Wildcat. Um, this is a good one. Willie the Wildcat has been popping into some of the schools. Here's a picture of Willie the Wildcat at the West Intermediate. Um, 
before becoming the interim athletic director. I was a PE teacher at the West. So Mr. Foster asked me if we could get Willie there for one of his assemblies. We had a student athlete uh, captain who's part of our captain's academy volunteer and did just such a great job. Uh, the little kids loved it. He gave tons of high fives. And during the assembly, he was helping Dr. Foster pass out pencils and you know wristbands and all this other stuff. It was, it was a successful hit. And if there's anybody watching, any of the principals, Willie the Wildcat is available to come visit your school and help out <laughs> with anything that you need. Uh, it was a nice way to promote athletics and kind of the town spirit, we thought. And I would get <clears throat> in big time, you get called to the principal's office tomorrow morning if I did not drop a roll of cats. Um, we will have a winter store available for anyone who's interested for some Wildcat gear. At the beginning of each season, some of the, some of the teams have their own um, store with team-specific stuff. So we wanted to kind of give them their own time. And then once that's done, we were going to open up a, a department-wide um, store with some gear if anyone's interested. Up here is posted my Twitter and my Instagram with my email. I'm always available if anybody needs anything or has any questions. Um, and that is your 2022 fall review. Thank you very, very much. Um, <coughs> questions, comments? Can you raise? Um, I have to say, I, I'm <coughs> so very proud of all the teams and the athletes and very grateful to the coaches to dedicate their time to um, enrich our student athletes and teamwork and um, and it's not always about success it's the lessons learned in defeat that make you successful and I, I'm so sincerely grateful for the investment in our student athletes and for our student athletes for never giving up and persevering um, I do have to say that I and I'll t I, I know I have my own personal I do um, love um, the inclusion of the Hall of Famers um, being inducted, we, that has never been presented to us before in that, and I think it's, um, I think it's just so, um, so rewarding, and they should be recognized. And I just got inducted into my high school um, through my uh, girls' basketball team, so um, it's still a little sur surreal. Because, but anyway, but I just, I think it's, it's, um, it's a legacy, and it's a, it's a wildcat legacy. They're always, they will always be wildcats, no matter wherever, where they go in this world. And I think um, those lessons learned in that time of your life, which you're learning and grasping now, will carry you into your adulthood. And um, and I just I just uh, I, I I just I, I think that's a great addition to the uh, to your report. Um, and lastly, I had a, just a quick question: um, How many teams do we currently have that are on wa waivers with eighth graders? Um, waivers, so in the past, in this fall season that just wrapped up, we had the golf team and we had field hockey and girls cross country. Okay. Uh, the way that the waivers work for the middle school is it's purely based on numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a scramble because we have our sign-ups and then we have our league meetings and we bring it to the league and it has to be voted on by the league first. Mm -hmm. Once it's voted on by the league, I contact um, the chairperson of the school committee, the superintendent and the principal of the high school and the middle school mm -hmm. since it's that building and it's purely based on numbers. Then it goes to a district and they just approve it. Okay. So do, do you, um, have you found in your time, uh, if you can answer, if you can't, that's perfectly fine. Um, are we having, um, are we finding more need in getting waivers um, to build our high school team? Um, yeah, I would say so. So our numbers, ob obviously we know the situation with our enrollment and that mm -hmm. has a direct correlation to the athletics, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you have less kids, you're going to have less kids doing specific events and athletics. Uh, so, yeah, we, we have seen an uprise okay. in, in it. And sometimes we have not been able to offer a third team, whether it's a JVB team or a freshman team, because mm -hmm. um, we haven't had enough numbers. Okay. And, it's, and it's not just a Wilmington problem or a right. Wilmington issue, more or less. It happens across the league and across the state. Or waivers for middle school are becoming more and more popular. Very good. Thank you so very and much. Congratulations on the Hall of Fame. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, the Hall of Fame committee, it's funny you brought up the legacy, is, t is one of their major projects that we're working on is trying to create a legacy wall um, somewhere in the athletic wing. Oh, really? Uh, where, athletic, where the Wildcats can be remembered forever, like you said. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Quickly, and just congratulations to all of our student athletes. I think it's... Um, remarkable how what kids learn by being on a, an athletic team learning how to manage your time 
and to work hard and to stay focused. Um, and a thank you to all of our coaches because, uh, you know, I don't think we, I think we don't realize how much of an influence our coaches have on our children um, and what positive role models that they are in our kids' lives. Um, so thank you to all of our coaches and thank you to all of our students for being such hard, hardworking um, kids and representatives of our town. Very, very much for being thank here. You. Thank, thank you, you everybody for being here tonight. It's nice to see all your smiling faces. Um, and happy birthday, Coach Patron. All right, thanks everybody. We can give them a round of applause. <coughs> You can stay. I always like to say, you can stay. <laughs> All right. Our next item of business we have our pack presentation from the Wildwood Pack, led by Kelly Peterson. Hello, and Hello. others. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having us. I can confirm that Willie the Wildcat was at West because it was early September and I've spent every morning telling my daughter he will not be there that day <laughs> since because she thinks he's mean. Don't tell him. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much for having us. Um, as Jen said, I'm Kelly Peterson. I have a five-year-old daughter, Hadley, at the West with Mrs. Holleran. Um, and I decided that a full-time job, three kids under five, and two dogs and a house weren't enough. So <laughs> let's, let's add one more thing to the list. So here I am, um, I'm a co-president this year of our pack. This is Catherine Camo. she is a fellow co-president. Her daughter Anna is at the Shawsheen. This is Michelle Scarcelli, she's a co-treasurer. Her son Anthony is at Woburn Street. And we also have three other members of our leadership team, Melanie Versteeg, her daughter is uh, Riley, she's at Woburn Street, she's a co-treasurer, and then our two co-secretaries are Shelby Brand and Nagwa Rabadi. Shelby's daughter is at West, Nagwa's son is at Woburn Street. So we like um, that we adequately represent students at all three locations, it worked out very well. And all of us, this is our first child um, entering the Wilmington school system, so we're all first timers here. Um, so when we got together for our first meeting as a leadership team, we decided to kind of talk about and brainstorm what our mission would be this year. So I think you could take a really shallow look at an organization like PAC and say, let's, let's fundraise money and then let's buy whatever the staff and the admin tell us to. But we wanted to have a little bit more of a purpose. So our mission, and this is also partly derived from our bylaws, but it's to enrich the educational experience of both our students and staff, so teachers and admin. And um, probably more important than ever for the Wildwood, we want to cultivate a sense of community. So we took that mission and we identified three key initiatives for the year. <coughs> and these are kind of the guiding pillars of um, why we're doing what we're doing. So student enrichment, teacher appreciation, and then ultimately to foster community. That's, that's what our goal is for the year. So I will just kind of talk you through how we're doing this. Um, first and foremost, we're working really closely with Principal Bissell to identify ways that we can enhance and enrich the educational experience of our kids. And we want to offer activities for the kids that are fun but perhaps more importantly, we want to support the existing curriculum. Um, as a first time mom, when I was introduced to the kindergarten curriculum, I realized it's a lot. It's, you don't go to kindergarten to play anymore. That, that's what I did, but my daughter's reading to me now. So um, we didn't want to make life harder for our teachers. So we're always trying to think about what can we do that will support what they're doing without getting in the way of all of the tasks that they have to check off their list. Um, and we've tried to prioritize enrichment opportunities that will directly address the challenges that have been presented to us as a result of the separation of our students. So just to name a few things to date, um, in September, 
I don't know if everyone here knows, but the children at West don't have a play structure. They don't have a playground um, like they did at the Wildwood. The Shawshine and Woburn Street kids are lucky. They, they do have play structures. So to kind of um, supplement that and to make it a little bit more equitable for the kids there, we purchased a sandbox that we installed for the kids at West. Um, Kath and I put our husbands up to doing it on a Saturday. <laughs> they were... Yeah more than thrilled <laughs> um, but my daughter says the kids love it we're happy that we could have contributed one little thing to kind of make their recess time a little more fun because they don't get that much play time as i already said so we we tried to make it good for them um in october we sponsored a ha halloween art <coughs> event or uh, activity and also an estimation activity so we had held a trick-or-treat community event that i will talk about in a few minutes and we had extra candy so we packaged it up into containers and we gave it to the classrooms so they could practice their estimation um, and we also got a donation from McKinnon's of 200 small pumpkins that we were able to give to all of the classrooms along with some decoration um, supplies and it sounds like it was a big hit we have a cute picture of the kids on this deck decorating their pumpkins um, in November, we received several requests from classrooms to donate baby wipes. They, I think they're used to having sinks in their classrooms and they don't all have those now. So baby wipes are in need and in demand. So we donated boxes of baby wipes. Um, we donated Play-Doh to teachers who requested it um, to use for mindfulness activities. And we also donated a Bluetooth speaker to the gym teacher because going from location to location, they needed something easy to transport that would also help make their classes more effective. And in December, we have planned a gingerbread magnet activity that we think the kids will enjoy and it'll be pretty easy for the, the teachers to oversee. <clears throat> Teacher appreciation. So, um, you know, as first time parents of kids in the school system, we are so grateful to these teachers who we're just giving our kids due for a day. They are the safe place for our kids now that we were for the last five years. So um, this is really important to us and we recognize the toll that the current physical separation can take on staff camaraderie, staff morale. They've been displaced from classrooms that some of them have taught in for years and years. Um, and our students rely on these teachers to succeed and they've demonstrated an unwavering commitment to our kids despite any challenges that they're currently faced with. So we really think it's our duty as a PAC to show our teachers that we appreciate them, we're grateful for all that they do, and their efforts are not going unnoticed. So in the fall, there was a teacher luncheon. Um, it was November 8th, and we sponsored it. So it was actually a teacher conference or training day. Training day. Um, so we decided to buy them lunch. So we had it catered, um, a local business in town worked with us and we provided lunch. We gave them a choice of what they could order. Um, we also organized a kind of like a small drive among Wildwood parents of um, homemade desserts. So a lot of people stepped up, they baked for it. It was really cute. So we had a really big dessert bar. Um, and then we did a pie and cookie dough fundraiser. So we decided as a pack to purchase um, either one pie or one box of cookie dough for each teacher and um, administrator so that they could have a little something for Thanksgiving and it was just a tangible way that we could show our thanks to them. Um, this winter we have invited teachers and staff to join us. So we're, we organized a kid meetup at Zoo Lights for this coming Saturday. Um, Michelle was able to procure a discounted rate for families. So we invited the teachers and staff to join us at that. We thought we got cheap tickets and it would be a nice thing for them to do with their families too. So they'll be, they'll be joining a pretty large group of Wildwood families. Um, and we've also procured some gift cards um, to get coffee that we'll be distributing to them at a later date. Um, the picture on the right makes me laugh because we, for our pie fundraiser, <coughs> We used my house to do the distribution and I got like 450 pies dropped off on a Monday and I didn't tell my husband exactly the story. And I didn't tell him that people would be coming in and out for five hours to pick up. So he sent me this picture from our security camera and, and said, do you know what's going on? <laughs> so, but it, it made me happy. 
happy. There's a mix of teachers and parents, and <coughs> it just made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> He's usually on board for my crazy ideas. Does he have a choice? He has no choice, exactly. <laughs> it's nice um, that you make him think, though, exactly. that he does. Exactly. Um, okay, so our, our third initiative for the year is to foster community, and distance usually makes the heart grow fonder, but we're dealing with five and six-year-olds, so we don't want them to feel that distance um, too much. So being spread across three different locations, we view it as our job to bring them together as much as we can to really foster that sense of community. They're all going to be back together in school next year, so it's important that they get to know each other and they play with each other and they expand their friendships and, and meet more people. Um, and in ways, we think of this as our most important goal of the year. Um, so Michelle spearheaded a kind of internal campaign that we're sharing with the families um, where we, we are Wildwood Strong. So part of this initiative was to do a swag sale where we are offering um, clothing and other items to our, our kids and our teachers and families. Um, a lot of them are branded with the Wildwood Strong logo, which we thought was pretty cool. There's also um, more generic Wildwood and Wilmington items, but we think it'll be really nice to see people around the community in this branded gear to show that we may not be together, but we, we are in spirit. Um, I skipped ahead a little bit. That was a, a big initiative in November. Back in September, I think it was the very first weekend after the school year started, we organized a playground meetup at Rotary Park. It was super simple. We just said, come at 10. And the kids came and they had a blast. So we did it again in October uh, and we had fundraised some money by then. So we were able to purchase some candy and we had the kids come in their costumes and we did a little parade around Rotary Park Lake and the kids trick-or-treated and it was really cute and I want to say attendance about doubled from September to October which was really promising and then for Zoo Lights Michelle got in trouble because we sold so many tickets at this discounted rate that they said we can't even accommodate this so we actually had to stagger the start time um, because we how many tickets sold there's 150 people going wow wow well. Yeah, so um, it's really exciting. It shows us that people are being receptive to the activities that are being planned and the things that we're doing. Um, for January, we decided enough for the kids. We've done enough for them. <laughs> we are going to Trey Mezzo, and we are going to have a parents' night out with um, a DJ who's going to do some sort of a bingo game, and we're going to have a cash bar and pizza, and it's going to be really fun. Um, so we will, we're not looking at that as a fundraiser, but we're also not going to turn down anyone who wants to give us money. So <laughs> we may collect some donations there, but the ticket prices will probably just cover the costs and um, we, may, we may do something in, in the form of fundraiser, especially if there's a cash bar, but TBD. Um, and then February, we're going to organize a family fun night. We're thinking around Valentine's Day, we'll do some sort of friendship event. We'll invite all of the, the families, the kids, the teachers, whoever wants to come. Um, hopefully we can hold it in a gym or, or somewhere central in town and um, more details to come on that. Uh, just a brief overview of our fundraising efforts. So we have ongoing passive fundraising um, throughout the year. So direct donations, uh, if anyone wants to donate, that is a QR code to get to our PayPal page. That's how we're taking um, donations. We also are utilizing Amazon Smile, which is great. I don't know if anyone's ever used that, but you basically just link your organization to your Amazon account, and every time you make a purchase, it a small percentage of it goes right to the pack or to whatever the charitable organization is. So that's been great. Um, Box Tops and Mabel's Labels are two others that are running constantly. Um, our first and really most successful fundraiser was our pie and cookie dough fundraiser. So we managed to raise in profit for the pack over $4,000, which was really big for us. I don't think that in the past, I don't think that more than 5000 has been raised for an entire year. Mm -hmm. So getting 4000 from one fundraiser was, was a really big deal. Uh, and we were really grateful for that. Um, coming up, we, we're going to partner up with Habit Burger in town. They 
offered us an opportunity to do an event where a portion of the proceeds earned within a certain amount of time on a certain day uh, will be donated to us. So we don't have a date yet, but more to come there. And then we're planning on doing some sort of silent online auction in probably February. Connect with us. We meet every single month on the second Monday of the month. It's um, via Zoom at 7 p.m. Principal Bissell sends out a link to the Zoom meeting um, in her Wildwood Weekly newsletter. Uh, we also post it on our Facebook page, so if you wanted to follow us on Facebook, you can get more information there. Um, and also, if you ever wanted more information or to get involved, send us an email at wildwoodpack at gmail.com. Um, reach out to us directly. We're always willing to chat. And we're always looking for new ideas, so new fundraising ideas, activity ideas, anything that anyone has in mind, we are open to. And that's it. Are there any questions for us about anything we're doing or anything I said? Great. I mean, this is so helpful for us to hear from you. And, and we're so excited. And thank you for <coughs> taking this on, especially spread across the three buildings. I think it's really important that you're helping to keep everyone connected. So we're appreciative of your time and for sharing that with us. Questions or comments? Mrs. Burns? I have to say that I'm, I'm just in awe of the work that you've done and the time I know that goes into each of these activities how so creative um, to support the, the teachers and the students across several buildings. And I just, I, I'm just elated with the outside of the box type of thinking, how do we solve this problem in order to um, keep our little community. And, and I, I, I'm just in awe and I'm, I thank you for um, investing in our staff and especially in all our students and um, the support from the parents, advisory councils are, are, are really make a difference. Um, I, I know that they, they truly make a difference and I thank you for your time invested in this. So. Thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing this. Did you have I, if I could, yeah, and thank you for being here. I, I met with uh, Ms. Bissell yesterday as part of my um, regular visits with principals and um, I actually thought the number was more than 150 tickets. So I hope that you don't have more, but, uh, but um, but, but, but in all honesty, what um, she, uh, it was clear how appreciative she was and is of your efforts and that it is paying it a difference, it's being felt. Um, this, it wasn't even about this presentation tonight or your, or your presence here, but she made a couple of comments about the, um, the impact that you are having on, on the staff in a very positive way. So, you know, uh, the work of, uh, of, of schools couldn't happen without the partnership of uh, community members and that holds true any time period, but certainly, uh, in times like these, uh, so thank you for uh, rising above and beyond to help support and 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 keep the staff going because I know you're you're clearly making a difference. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Our next item of business: we have approval approval of items by consensus. Approval of minutes, November sixteenth, twenty twenty two. Is there a motion? Thank you, Mr. Fennelly. Seconded by Mr. Turner. All in favor? <clears throat> it's unanimous. Warrants G15, 16, 17, R17, 18, 19, L40, 41, 42, 43, 44, and FS24, 25, 26, and 27. Is there a motion? Thank you, Mrs. Burns. Second, Mr. Ragsdale. All in favor? That's unanimous. Payrolls ending 11 23 2022 and 12 7 2022. Is there a motion? Thank you, Mrs. Plowman. Seconded by Mr. Samaha. All in favor? That's unanimous. And SPED 19, 20, and 21. Mr. Fennelly, seconded by Mr. Smaha. All in favor? And that's one abstention, Tracy. All right, that brings us to our superintendent's report, Dr. Brand. Uh, thank you. Uh, just one evening, uh, one item, sorry, this evening, um, and I'll turn it over to uh, the gentleman on my left. Good evening, thank you. Uh, in your packet was uh, our FY22. As I mentioned, every year uh, all, all school districts have to send to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education report that identifies essentially every penny that goes into and goes out of the district. Um, so in your packet, it's just a copy of that. It's, uh, you can see it's pretty voluminous, and if you've been in my office, there's three binders worth of information that backs up the numbers <laughs> in the report. That's great. Thank you very much. Are there questions or comments? Mr. Fennelly? 
Paul, if I could, as I often do, anything that jumped out as weird or unexpected or pretty standard and yeah, no, what you would expect. Yeah, just uh, similar to every year, just uh, a lot of work and a lot of info. Oh, on each item. <laughs> Sorry, it's sideways. Melissa, do you want this? <laughs> I have to print it it's out. Okay. It's okay. I just, I wanted to understand um, where it says some of the numbers. So like at the top of the columns, it'll say school committee and then like 1410. What does that represent? That could be just the column number. Okay. So there's instructions in certain expenditures have to go into certain columns if I'm understanding your question right so it'll, it could say if that's what you mean like up the top it says 14 and yep. then below it there's a whole bunch of numbers or yes it's the ones that are always in parentheses like this where it no. says row line or am I in the wrong place no okay. sorry I was trying to help <laughs> I'll ask you I can ask you uh, offline too yeah it, but typically the, the top of each page has column number that okay. below it might have a description of what's in that column if that's uh, or you can we can talk that's just for like your purposes of knowing yeah it, it's actually probably part of the report okay it's a physical Excel spreadsheet that has to be filled out all those numbers are manually entered the majority of them are manually entered. Okay. some are automatically entered by Desi but for the most part they're entered by me okay All right, thank you. Um, our next item of business, we have new business and one item tonight, planning for student needs, special education. This is a presentation, I think by Yes. Brown the I, brand, you want to introduce sure, sure, I will. Thank you. As they're coming forward, um, uh, tonight we have uh, our uh, director of student support services, Alice Allegrand, and our coordinator of special education, um, Sula Abusius, who's here tonight. Um, and just some sort of context and setup for this. You know, as you know, we are heading into well, we are really in the budget planning season, and. Um, as you know, we have uh, two uh, really important upcoming budget presentations planned, December 21st here for the prelim preliminary budget and then the recommended budget um, uh, in the new year. Uh, we, we thought that it would be important uh, it's in, and timely uh, to take a little bit of a different tact or approach here and uh, provide a little bit more of a comprehensive overview of um, student support services specifically and uh, really a snapshot of the realities that uh, as a district like so many others are facing right now this is um, it's it's connected certainly to budget and budget planning but I think also more importantly um, provides you as a committee and our community with uh, an update on some of the many challenges that uh, we are continuing to face uh, coming out of the pandemic uh, and so tonight as opposed to incorporating this into the budget presentation for example next week we thought that it might be more appropriate to spend a little bit more time on this as a somewhat of a standalone topic and provide you with an opportunity to also perhaps ask more questions if you have so with that thank you ladies for being here tonight thank you for having us it's been a while <laughs> So um, we're gonna do kind of a, an interesting kind of start. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which I know many of you are familiar with. I think sometimes we only think of it as it relates to school age kiddos. And so I'd like to just talk a little bit about early intervention, which we've never really talked about at school committee as long as I've been here. Um, and I'll explain kind of why as we go along, if that's okay. And then we're gonna talk about um, a STRIDES programming as it's connected to early intervention. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then where we're um, heading in terms of the district needs. So typically when we've done presentations in the past around programming in the district, it's in response to what we're seeing in the community. So we're gonna, in terms of what a need might be. So that's really why we're starting with IDEA, if that makes sense. So <clears throat> I know all of you kind of know IDEA. It's the law that makes available um, education services, related services for children with disabilities. Um, you know, started in 1975, reauthorized in 2004 to provide really more access to um, the services that are appropriate within the school district as well as they change some provisions of it but it covers al also infants and toddlers which I think people don't typically think of um, and kind of we our responsibility when a child is aging out of early intervention would be aging in at age three into the school district the Massachusetts law kind of that's related people 
typically are the older people in the room, myself included, think of chapter 766, it's actually chapter 71B. Um, thanks. So there's really four parts to IDEA. The first is kind of what people think of as the regulations related to the law. So part A governs kind of the provisions, the timelines, um, all of the components of um, how to access services for kiddos, kind of the more regulations when you think of it. B is what we typically think of as a public school as it relates to um, covering students from ages 3 to 21 and um, the specifics regarding evaluation timelines in there, um, what is the law regarding the federal law, right? Massachusetts has different laws regarding timelines um, for kids that are school age and what, how that relates to least restrictive environment. The part C, which we'll talk about in a second, covers birth to age um, 36 months or age three. The last part is where we get our funding from. So the 240 grant, that is our, the only really grant that we have for special ed services in the district, um, as well as research for institutions in the country and funding through the government for those institutions comes out of the IDEA part D. Um, so part C, just gonna back up for one second, covers kiddos um, that might develop a delay or born with a delay that might require services. Um, they receive those services not under what we would typically think of as an IEP, they receive it under a individual family services plan. So the plan is written, might, services might be delivered in the home, might be delivered in a center, daycare center, Head Start center. Um, and it covers that child from whenever they're eligible. For some kids, it's immediately following birth, depending on their birth circumstances, um, through the point at which they turn three. Um, and I'm, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Sula to talk about what our process is and then how they come to us, if that's okay. Yep. Hi, everyone. Good Hi, evening. welcome. Um, and so we thought it was appropriate to kind of go over a little bit of what that process is that occurs when early intervention sends over their referrals, the upcoming referrals or pending referrals um, to the special education department through the district. Um, and so students who receive early intervention or are suspected of, of having a disability are referred to the district at around two and a half years of age. Um, so we get them ahead of time enough that we have time to sort of look at the profiles of the kiddos that are coming our way to be evaluated mm -hmm. and maybe kind of start to think about pre-planning um, for what services may come our way when those kids, when those kiddos age in. And so typically at around 2.8, so we'll hold that referral for a couple of months. Um, at around 2.8, 2.9 years of age, we will initiate the referral. Um, and uh, uh, generate the evaluation consent home that we then send to families, which really seeks their uh, written consent for us to move forward with completing the assessments that are listed based on the information that early intervention provides to us about the needs of the students and whatever services they may have accessed um, uh, in EI. Um, so for eligible students, the district is responsible for ensuring, for ensuring that an IEP is in place by their third birthday. And so our timeline kind of aligns with that. And so before their third birthday, typically there is the eligibility meeting through special education has occurred. Um, and a student is then found eligible for services, whether that's related services only. Sometimes maybe communication is the only area that needs to be developed. Uh, sometimes it's occupational therapy for fine motor skills um, or physical therapy. Other times we kind of see sort of <coughs> more general delays that kind of go across different areas. And so in those cases, the recommendation would be a little bit more substantive in that teams would recommend uh, pre-K integrated programs. So programs where special ed students are present alongside their gen ed peer model. Um, typically, I believe in this district that happens through a lottery system uh, for the gen ed peers, um, but really pre-K programs exist for our special ed pre-K students, three to five or three to until they enter kindergarten. Um, so the, some of the recent trends that we have seen, and we'll go a little bit about more of the specific numbers that we are seeing. Um, is that we are really seeing a significant increase in all early intervention referrals, whether it's maybe one particular area, typically communication, where kids are not really developing their expressive language skills um, um, as, as expected, as developmentally expected. 
Uh, and we're also seeing a significant increase in numbers with students who are coming in with either a diagnosis of autism or a profile that maybe leads us to believe that that could be an area that we will be looking at. Um, and then, you know, for some of our ASD uh, kiddos who are coming in um, with significant disabilities, that then leads us to increased specialized programming for them. Um, so, um, you know, we, we do have the opportunity to kind of think ahead as we're getting those referrals to kind of gauge what kind of resources we are going to need when those students age in. So we thought it was important to give you a quick snapshot of what the numbers look like over the past couple of years in regards to early intervention referrals alone. So this is just EI referrals. We certainly have a whole number of parent referrals when students are four years old, four and a half, maybe three. Um, those are not accounted here. And we also have referrals through the IST process. So our gen ed peer models who are part of those pre-K integrated classrooms, if you know, we see that there may be an area of need that we are noticing, we will then try to put in some tiered interventions first within the classroom setting. And if those are not uh, successful with that student, then the school will make a referral to special education on behalf of that student with the parent, of course, knowing that this is sort of happening. And so going back to 2018, 2019, we were able to gather that we had about 19 early intervention uh, referrals. Of those 19, 14 students were found eligible for special education, whether it's just uh, related services, speech, OT, PT maybe. Uh, of those 14, four um, were students who required STRIDES programming, whether they had the ASD disability diagnosis or whether they're uh, delays were sort of developmental across the board where they required that kind of programming. Um, in 2019, 2020, we received 15 referrals, so more or less the same. Seven of those 15 were found eligible and then two required strides programming. Um, we Remember kind of we closed two in 20. Yes, yeah, so we so. kind of left out that COVID year just because Evaluations were not really happening, you know, with the expected timeline. Um, there were a lot of gaps in programming, in staffing, all those things. So the numbers that we had for that particular year are not really, um, they don't support sort of the typical trend for a particular year. So we skipped that year. We went to 21, 22 last school year. And this is where we saw a, a jump um, in the referrals. So we had 44 ref referrals through EI, 31 of those 44 uh, were students who were found eligible for special education. And out of those 31, eight students required STRIDES programming, so the ABA methodology, um, which is, as you can see, that's a huge, it's double almost, a huge jump from years past. Um, and so this year, we are continuing to kind of uh, work through these referrals. We have had th 32 uh, as of 11.30. Uh, I think maybe I have received another seven since then, which are not accounted in these numbers. Um, and so of these 32 so far, we have found nine students eligible, but some of these 32 are still in the evaluation process, so we haven't gotten to that eligibility meeting yet. And so this number nine is as of today or as of uh, November 30th. Um, of those nine, two of the students have required STRIDES programming and ABA methodology. Um, of the, the referrals that we have so far, those 32, eight of those look like they may require more specialized programming, maybe strides, maybe integrated pre-K, but more or less a day program of some sort. Um, we, we have that as an asterisk because for a couple of those, okay, a couple of those students, the eligibility meeting has occurred and we have recommended strides programming, but the parents have not either responded or have not accepted our proposal. So as soon as they do, those students will go right into those classrooms. 
Um, in some other occasions, um, we are uh, just awaiting the eligibility process you know, for that 2.8, 2.9 um, time to come so that we can send the evaluation consent and then the timeline can start. And for others, we're just, we've sent out the consent and we're just awaiting parent response. So, but we're thinking as of right now that we have about eight potential students who may require just increased programming uh, supports for their needs. Um, so. so the way uh, that the district uh, responds uh, for programming or recommendations for maybe additional supports or maybe not um, requiring the supports that we have previously uh, had is through the community need. So the district responds to student and, f and family needs as they arise by providing a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. And least restrictive environment can mean different things for different students depending on how they present, depending on the, the needs that they have. So we are lucky enough in this district to have a range of programs. So we have full inclusion programs, we have partial inclusion programs where, um, so full inclusion is, uh, so maybe a quarter of their day is in a, in a separate setting or in a small group. Partial inclusion is a little bit more. And then we have our substantially separate programs which are our strides programs. Uh, where the majority of a student's day is really in a self-contained classroom working in that ABA discrete trial methodology where they need, you know, one-to-one -one or maybe, um, you know, a smaller teacher-to-student ratio in order for that methodology to take place. Um, now, if the district does not have the option or the range of programs um, that we have been able to utilize so far, then the district needs to find a placement to meet the needs of those students. In most cases, that means that we are looking and seeking out of district placements where they're able to support the students with significant needs. And sometimes out of district placements are the least restrictive environment for those students. There's nothing less than that. Um, and that's okay, Th those students are still part of our community, they're still part of our department here. We follow them closely and we make sure and evaluate whenever the team meets or throughout the year, whether we can step down or maybe step up or maybe leave the same, whatever programming that student receives. Um, so by developing programs though in the district, there's also an additional um, you know, additional resources that sort of go along with that. And so for our strides programs, not only do we need to have qualified teachers uh, and ed assistants, but we also need access to BCBAs that support that program. We also need access to speech and language pathologists who are trained to work with those uh, students who have those significant communication, expressive, receptive language needs. Um, and so, you know, in, in this in this district, we have that, and I, I, you know, this need is really the area for us where we see um, a lot of growth, uh, and we, we have a lot of more referrals for those types of uh, profiles for students. Um, so I think, you know, a, a couple of years ago, I was probably sitting here and we were talking about kind of a different profile of students. Um, and we were really talking about building up our social emotional programs in the district. And I think we've done that. We've done a really good job with that. We have programs pre-K through 12. Um, we also have strides programming pre-K through 12. Um, and I think, you know, our development of those programs was directly in response to what we were seeing in the community, even pre-pandemic post-pandemic obviously changed that um, dramatically, but I think, you know, Stuhl and I's intention of kind of presenting tonight was in, is to talk about not only what we're seeing, but, and I, I know that at one point last year we talked a little bit about the rates of autism as well. Um, you know, just, these are scary numbers, I think, when you look at them, right? Um, not that long ago, in 2000, about a, one in 150 births of, you know, rates, you would see a, di a child diagnosed with autism. It's about one in 44 currently. Um, and, you know, the why of that, I think, is, is the question um, that I think everybody in the world at this point is probably asking. Um, but I think we, you know, are definitely seeing the impact of that. I'm not sure what degree the pandemic also played in some of what we're seeing with all of our kiddos across the board. Um, the STRIDES program is exactly the program for the kiddos that require more. 
that they require more intensive services. They require ABA methodology, which is a very specific type of educational methodology for students to learn um, skills in a very discreet way and then learn how to generalize those skills across, um, you know, uh, not only settings but also just within their classroom. Um, and the programming does require more than what your average class would be able to provide for more of these, for these students. Um, I do know Sula and I kind of belong to, as many of us do, um, other groups um, with other people that are similar jobs as us, so job alikes, and this is happening everywhere at the moment, um, that the early intervention group of kids that are aging out of early intervention, the rates of kids that are diagnosed with autism that have pretty significant needs across the board um, is climbing and there's a number of districts struggling. A number of districts don't even have pre-K programs for um, kiddos that have this mm -hmm. and are even looking at s spots in other districts. Um, so, you know, I think that this is something that's not just us, that, uh, unfortunately, that are struggling with. Um, so our budget proposal, oops, thanks, <laughs> um, is, uh, so why are we adding it to Shawshin is the question that I'm sure. So what we're seeing at, the po at this point is the kiddos that are aging in over the last couple of years, we now have a very large group of kiddos that are leaving kindergarten and entering first grade. We already have a strides classroom at the um, Shawshin. It's impossible to combine the six, possibly seven, but six for sure kiddos that are going from kindergarten into the existing program at the Shawshin. Um, it's just not doable to have 13 or 14 kiddos with this level of need in the classroom. It's also not legal. <laughs> um, but aside from that, it's not good practice. Um, I eat a kid's with this level need require more. They require um, less uh, student, a higher student to teacher ratio and really just require more um, services. Um, we have over the last couple of, so just to back up for one second, the, the other piece that we were able to do under one of the grants over the last couple of years because the needs of the students in these programs um, really were very significant coming out of the pandemic was we added um, through one of the grants four educational assistants to each of the um, programs, one at the Wildwood, one at the Shawshin, one at the West, and one at the Middle School. Um, I'm going to show you a chart in a second, which I'm sure you've taken a look at, looking at the programs that we have actually added already over the last couple of years, um, given in response to. So our current classrooms, um, our you know, number of classrooms, as far as I could go back, going almost back to 2000, there's nobody really left <laughs> that was here then. Um, so it seems as though the two classrooms at the Wildwood have existed for a long time, and then being one classroom kind of everywhere else. Um, and I would say up until a couple of years ago, I, we, we had years where the numbers were maybe even low in one of those two classrooms at the beginning of the year, and then we would have students age in. Um, a couple of years ago, we started to see a significant significant increase, we had to add a number of classrooms. The current is that we have three classrooms at the Wildwood. We added a fourth classroom at the Boutwell um, at the start of this year. Um, added, and then we have this, the um, current classrooms, one at the Shawshine West Middle School and High School. Um, the proposed is to keep the current early childhood um, because we think with the numbers of kids moving up and with the number of kids moving on, we should be okay at the early childhood center. But those students need somewhere to go at the Shawshin um, for next year. So I just, I've used this chart a couple of times, so <laughs> uh, just to have a sense of the programs that have been added since I have been in the district, or uh, even the first year I was actually in a different role, but um, in August of 21, we had to add a Wildwood Strides, uh, we added the Boutwell Strides this year, um, and we're adding the Shawshin Strides for the start of next year is the proposal. Um, so cost analysis are difficult to do because it never captures kind of everything necessarily. But um, you know, when we're looking at students that um, are in our strides programming, they're typically uh, that are struggling or might require more. They are typically already in a full day placement in our district. Um, they typically have a, a you know pretty low teacher to student ratio, and they're receiving a tremendous amount of support in our programs. So generally, um, students that are in those programs, when they exit, they usually will exit, um, not necessarily to a, a public day school, a collaborative. They will typically exit to something that's a little bit more, um, provides a little bit more support, which then also increases the tuition amount a little bit. Um, so if you're looking at something like the May Center, Melmark, something like that, it's more money, um, which is typically where our students that exit strides um, go. Um, 
you know, out of district, if you're looking at one student, it's about a, currently about 105,000 a year. Uh, going with the program that's the closest, it'd be about $20,000 per student busing. Um, if we were to go with this program that was farther out, it would cost more. But um, so the three-year cost just on one student is is a lot of money. Never mind what we're looking at if we were to have to um, find another place for these students to go for next year. Um, so I know the numbers are sometimes a little bit fuzzy because there's you know built-in transportation costs that we have obviously are transporting kids in district and there's service providers and such um, but there is a cost benefit to it um, and you know I, I think for me I always always felt, felt very strongly and I know Sula does too that um, not all of our kids are perfect for all of our programs some kids need more and that's okay but the ones that really we can house and service here and keep them connected to their community and their peers it's important that we make the effort to do that and I think you guys have certainly done that over the years with just the amount of programs that we've added um, so I you know I think that's what we're hoping to do here um, the other thing we just kind of want to bring up, which is interesting, because I know we've talked a lot about enrollment. I don't know if my am, am I going over yet. Yeah. yeah. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So we we started to keep track of the students or the families that are moving into our district and maybe what those families are requiring as far as special education services. So we kind of put this out a little bit on a graph just to give a little bit of a visual. But last year, we had about 169 families move into the district from other towns or maybe other states. Um, of those, 36 were, were families with children with special education needs, uh, which we kind of calculated to be about 18% of those move-in families. Of those 36, four required out of district placements. They came to us with an IEP, a legal document that said this is what they need. So we needed to seek out those, those types of placements for them. Um, and five of those required a substantially separate classroom, which we were able to, to provide with, within, our, um, within our programs. This year, so far as of November 21, we've had 96 families move in to the district. Uh, of those, 26 have uh, children with uh, special education needs. Of those 26, three have already required or have come into the district with out of district placements that we then needed to uh, seek a placement and, f and find an appropriate placement for them. And one of those students has required a substantially separate classroom uh, for the strides, for our strides programming. So not only are we seeing an increase with our early intervention referrals, and just the level of need um, is much more significant than in years past. But now we're also seeing a trend where families are moving in, maybe because we have programs. We often get uh, you know, a few phone calls throughout the year. We're thinking of moving, and these are the towns that we're, we're moving, we're thinking about, and what programs does Wilmington have because our children have these needs. Um, sometimes that's a, a reason why families decide mm -hmm. to move to a particular town. Um, and it looks like, especially for our strides, ABA programs, um, we are certainly utilizing them for the families that are moving in, um, which is a great resource for us to have as a district. But it also sort of creates a, you know, a greater need for us to continue to develop these programs um, and possibly expand, expand them. Um, so we just wanted to mention kind of ongoing challenges also related to this, you know, uh, the amount of students, um, uh, you know, if, if you look, take a look at kind of some of the DESE data that are being picked up for eligible for special education has increased significantly since the pandemic. Um, I don't think we're necessarily seeing it in the same um, uh, rates as some of the other districts are, but there's definitely uh, an impact. I think some of the districts like you know, uh, more of the urban districts are growing at a much higher rate uh, of eligibility than we are, but we are definitely seeing an impact. I know we talked a little bit last year about the rate to referral, the amount of kids that were being evaluated. That continues um, to be an issue. Um, the Just the amount of um, turnover and staffing, I think, as all school districts are struggling with this, continue. Um, and making sure that we maintain compliance. It's better this year uh, than it was last year, but the filling of positions coming post-pandemic was, was extremely challenging. Um, 
you know, transportation, we continue to have um, <coughs> shortages in bus drivers for some of our out-of-district kiddos, um, and it's requiring some of the transportation companies to, um, you know, kind of group uh, kids on buses and ends up having longer routes um, for kiddos to get what they need um, from school. Um, and then um, I'm not, I know that Glenn talked to this probably a while ago, but the um, state has given um, the out of district placements permission to go up to 14% of an increase going into next year. Um, I know some of the collaboratives have come out and said that they're not going to do quite that high, um, but we're anticipating most of them are going to take it. So it's going to have a significant impact on all the districts, a 14% increase in tuition. So questions? I do always just kind of put this up. Oh, sorry. Um, because I do think it's important. I love this report. For those of you that have uh, ever never had the opportunity to read it, I would take a look at it. It's Thomas Hare's report on the review of special ed in Massachusetts, um, talking about uh, services that <coughs> districts provide. Um, and um, it's just a good little old at this point, but still a good report. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Mrs. Palmer. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, thank you um, for t walking us through how things are looking right now. Um, you know, I, I see there's a clear emphasis on our strides programming, um, but I'm also just a little curious about given you know, the state of mental health in kids. So, you know, not a developmental kind of lens that we're looking through, but more of a social emotional lens. How are our programs doing? Are we sort of busting at the seams with our social emotional programs as well? Are, are, what is our process, I guess, for referrals into those programs? And are, you know, is there space in those programs? Are we struggling with that? What's the status of those? We're okay uh, with the social emotional programs at the moment. I would not add, I think we're kind of right where we need to be. Um, the, so the process is actually the same, the special education process for those programs. So you go through eligibility. Um, sometimes kids already have an IEP and they might be struggling. Uh, the team typically might reconvene or do additional assessments to determine what additional services a student might need. Programming could be an additional uh, service um, and the team makes the decision regarding those placement options for a kiddo whether it's an in district or an outside the district placement um, we are lucky that we have programs pre-k through 12 social emotional programs as well as the bright program which is not a special ed program at the high school which is really for students that are exiting from a hospitalization or medical issues that need a kind of a soft re-entry into school um, uh, because it, coming back can sometimes be very overwhelming um, and it gives That's them right just at the high school we do just at the high school yep um, so I, I think we are at the moment right where we need to be with our social emotional programs um, which I, I have to be honest with you if we were sitting here just post pandemic seeing what we were seeing in that very first year back I was worried um, but I, I think we've been able to put some additional supports in place, which I think we're going to talk about maybe at the next mm -hmm. school committee meeting, I think Christine Murray and I, um, that have helped um, as well uh, support all kids, mm -hmm. not just kids in programs in the district from a social emotional point of view. Mrs. Pence. Um, can, because I, um, it's, uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I, I do appreciate that. I know it's really, I know it's a very condensed presentation that many may, may not realize, but it is very condensed, um, which um, I thank you time-wise. But um, I wanna, I, I'd like to ask you <clears throat> with the move-in, because it's, um, I know we, you started off the presentation with the referrals, which are important, but then we, we seg uh, segued into the move-ins. A two-part question. Where do you see, um, for those moving into the district, mm -hmm where the biggest hits are, are we talking about in the elementary area, the middle school area, or the high school area? Because I think it's really important with regards to the balance. Yep. Because um, it's it's not like a, um, and I, especially as we talk about budget, you know, and especially post-COVID, um, those, as we've seen, mental, the mental health and social emotional realm, it also impacts in the other developmentally challenged mm -hmm. um, diverse learners that we have in our district so I, I'm just curious to see what what you've been seeing with regards to the move-in it's mostly elementary mostly yeah. okay mostly elementary yeah 
Um, and I would say actually historically has been here when we've gotten referrals. Hand, we get a handful maybe of, uh, excuse me, of move-ins. Um, of kiddos that are older, occasionally we get some middle school, but it, is, it has been at least the yeah, last couple of years. So a Shawshank and Uber, so you yeah. grade one yeah. three well, typically. Yeah. I'm thinking, because we're all preparing for the, those COVID babies who haven't had yeah. those, that, that um, access to yep. social um, things. Um, <coughs> I, so I, I worry that as we move forward, we yep. will still see that fallout yep. um, in that realm. But um, how, um, what's, what's the evaluation numbers like, mid, like this time of year or mid-year? Um, yep. that is that the department is seeing because I think that's um, rel really relative with regards to mid-year services yep. un unanticipated that we provide which every time we provide one or two or several services it's it's budget wise it's a it, it grows yep. do you know what I mean so I was just curious what uh, maybe if this year yep. may not be accurate but yep. yeah, I'd be interested so so far this year and this was as of December 5th mm -hmm. um, and again, we've gotten a whole bunch more um, since then. Uh, but we've had 109 referrals so far. Um, and it's sort of balanced across town between the Wild, uh, Wildwood Boutwell, Shawshank, Woburn Street. It's sort of balanced. Somehow it works out that way. Um, what about the west and north um, And brackets? the west and the north. So okay. those referrals tend not to be as heavy throughout the year. Sure. Typically, we get the referrals you know, K, grade one, two, three. Right. Um, when kids are sort of learning to read, to do math, those are the skills that are sort of popping up th when there are deficits. Um, then they slow down a little bit for grade four and five. Um, sometimes we see an increase in middle school, um, and then it really drops off uh, for our high school students. But so far this year, we have 109. Uh, last year, we had 217 within so that year. year, but then we had an overflow from the year before where we weren't able to complete those assessments for a variety of different reasons. Right. Um, and those were um, 47, so we had about, you know, 200. You, as they progress up through the grades, do you think the current um, uh, intervention plans are help balance that referral, like the DCAP? You know, um, as I just, uh, you know, just weighing that data and the effectiveness <coughs> of those interventions with regards to the number of referrals that, um, that you're, you have to, like, act upon for formal evaluation. I think the DCAP is a very important document. I think it, it, you it, know, is. it really I'm outlines. Making sure yep. it's being executed. Oh, and, yeah. Yep. And that it's a supportive yep. um, tool in yep. this process. Another yep. positive and I think great resource that we have is our uh, reading interventions mm -hmm. and our math interventions right. through general ed and those are the screeners that are happening and the progress monitoring that takes place throughout the year. And so we are catching students earlier mm -hmm. with their deficits and weaknesses in reading and math and providing those targeted interventions. Then we come back to the team, you know, and then maybe a referral will come to special education a little bit later on. But you know we are fortunate enough to have that you know multi-tiered support system in, in those young grades when you know those uh, academic skills become really apparent when there's a, a deficit or a weakness there. Thank you very much. So just remember the um, referrals she's talking about are initial referrals. So there's they're not quoting <coughs> reavals or students that are on IEP mm -hmm. that might be having additional. These are just initial evaluations. Yep. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Turner, sorry, and then thank you. Just yeah. thank you. First of all, thank you very much. Very, very helpful, and especially the way you explained it all. I think you just answered my question, but I want to make sure. So, the 32, for example, in this year is early intervention, so pre pre K age groups, and then the 109 you mentioned would be anyone total, total would yeah. would be total, including the, okay. Yeah. So yeah. we get more students entering the programs, or at least referred. Correct. from the ages of four and five on Correct. in yes. the first few years, as you said, yeah. as they're starting to engage with the teachers. That's mm -hmm. right. Okay, so. That's right. And so we have early intervention referrals, we have parent referrals, and then we have our instructional support team referrals. Yes. Um, so there's a variety of, of sources uh, for those. And so that's part of where I was going for the, the community's benefit. These numbers are, are important numbers, but they are a portion of the, yes. the overall picture Correct. for the entire program that we provide. Yep. is a much larger group of students than these numbers reflect. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so I guess my question, it, it might be a little bit about like 
asking you to predict the future. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I apologize if it's that. Wall. That would be great. Um, <laughs> but you know, I'm thinking about how you were saying that you had these <clears throat> students at the Boutwell and the Strides program, and now we need to open up space in the Shawshank. Yep. So I'm thinking, after the Shawshank, are you going to need to open up, you know, the West and then the middle school and then the high school and continually increase? So I guess part of my question is, do you see depending on the students, and I know it's, it, it's making a big generalization here, but it, based on students transitioning maybe out of strides and, and maybe transitioning into like a less restrictive uh, placement or, or less restrictive services, do you see that happening for like a kid that might need strides in K, one, two, three, by the time they get to fourth grade, maybe they've gained some skills and they don't need it de that. definitely happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's our goal for all of our kiddos. I would say um, the group of kiddos that we're seeing that is coming up uh, do have a little bit more of a profound delays than I would say were typically the group that we would be seeing. I mean, when, when I first started, we would maybe have a couple of kids a year that ended up um, exiting early intervention in, in, in one of our programs. Um, it's just, it's jumped significantly. The uh, kiddos that we've, you know, we've had some kids move in that are age level from other states this year that clearly have an autism diagnosis, might have no language, and are sitting in a gen ed classroom with no support, no IEP, kind of nothing, that are coming from other places in the country. Um, and I think, you know, we're lucky that we're in Massachusetts because we have, you know, a great education system that has things kind of in check. I don't think that's necessarily the case in some other portions of the country, and we're definitely seeing people flocking. Um, I think it's a pattern to kind of the Northeast in part for special education services for kids. Um, so we've had a couple of those, which I never, I'm not sure that I ever saw that prior. Um, a five or six year old with no language that clearly ha has an autism diagnosis with no services, sitting in a gen ed classroom, yeah. And um, yeah, go ahead. So sometimes too, when we are getting those EI referrals or maybe a parent referral, and it looks like a student may require ABA methodology, but we're not quite sure because maybe there's some conflicting information, or maybe when we do our evaluations, maybe we see you know some signs of you know growth or potential growth. So we oftentimes will come to the table, we'll find the student eligible but then may exercise to, you know, the process of extended evaluation into a STRIDES program for 40 days, um, kind of see how that student will engage with that programming, whether it's necessary, whether it's maybe not necessary, um, and then <coughs> at that 40th day, we will make a determination as a team whether that will continue to be the uh, recommendation for placement or maybe we go to a less restrictive which is our integrated pre-k mm -hmm. other times we'll do the opposite if we're not quite sure we'll start with integrated pre-k and then if it just it doesn't look like it's working out very well we then may do an extended eval or a placement into our strides program so it's really hard because we don't know those kiddos that are coming in through EI we only see them on a one-to-one -one or maybe an arena style assessment so we, we don't really know how they're going to engage with peers or with following directions and so sometimes we struggle with the determinations following an eligibility meeting but we have the ability to do that because of our programs I, I have another question I don't know it was somebody else I was going to go please finish so it's 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 a, it's a little bit different I, I so the the cost analysis I, I appreciate you sort of breaking down those numbers and really looking at the savings that we as a district you know by spending money on additional classrooms by spending money on additional teachers and um and, and you know educational assistance we're actually reducing our our cost from out of district placements and the proposed or I don't know if it's proposed or, or where it's going, the, that 14% increase is going to significantly increase the costs to the district. And so I see adding more classrooms and more services that maybe there's ways of, maybe some kids are placed out of district now and those, that, those costs are gonna go up. So maybe we should start to say, hey, what are some programs that we can do you know, in-house, you know, in so to speak? Um, so I, I, guess, I guess it's not really a question. It's just sort of a comment that that, that increase is going to be is going to play a huge role <coughs> in like you know where special education is going. In the it, 
And just, it, just to, um, you know, we should and will come back to that as part of the overall budget planning, but I think that, that what you're hitting upon is a really fundamental piece here that we have talked about and I know uh, has been talked about at, uh, at other meetings in terms of, um, you know, you saw the slide with the expansion of programs over the years. And I, and I remember very well uh, when I was sort of preparing to come into this role and learning about the district, the level of out-of-district placements that it won not that long ago that we had um, as a district. And I'm forgetting the number right now, but I think 90, 93. <laughs> um, now, certainly an argument can be made that our overall population has declined since that point in time, and that's true. Um, and certainly the argument can always be made that, you know, one year is not the same as the next, right? You can't compare apples to apples. However, the point is that now our out of district is I should know, 62. Thank you. Um, so that comes about because of the program expansion, the building, the foundation that has been set to, as Alice was talking about, accommodate these students. But so too with that has had to come the additional staffing. So when we are talking about sort of an analysis of our overall enrollment, how does that align with staffing? It's a far more complex picture to sort of unpack than just a, a direct correlation. Um, and that cost, you know, we, we sometimes have the internal dialogue around is it, is it cost savings, is it cost avoidance? You know, there's, there's a whole element to that as well too, and I, but I think it's, you know, starting with where and when we can provide a program in district, we, we can and we should, um, and along with that is the maximization of, of, you know, limited economic resources that, that benefit the rest of our district as well. So um, something we'll come back to as well, uh, you know, in future presentations. But thank you, and I and I think Jane and Glenn kind of touched on and may have answered it. But back to the the budget slide here, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. This 105 thousand per out of district is current fiscal year, right. and that right. for up to 14 percent increase. Is isn't reflected year. in this number. No, that's it's not. Year, yeah, so I didn't want it to be fuzzy now. <coughs> whatever, whatever, so. So, but whatever this number is, is going we'll, to be some version higher for correct. next year. Yeah, they typically go up between 3 and 5%. We get the letters every year. Yeah. Um, I think one time that I can think of, Paul, we had a program that um, was struggling go up 6%. We got a letter for that, at least that I can remember, um, which everybody was in an uproar over. So to be given a 14% permission is essentially what was given by the state. Um, is not something I've ever seen. Right. Yeah. Authorized up to up 40, to 14%. So like you said, it doesn't necessarily mean nope. every program will go up that yep. much, but they can. Yep, and all the programs have increased their uh, prices of their ancillary services over the last two years significantly. Um, I know that they're all struggling with most of them, the same thing that all the public schools are struggling with in terms of staffing, retaining staff, paying them well so that they stay, you know. So I would not be surprised that um, Healthcare is struggling in the same way, which yeah. is direct uh, direct correlation, I yeah. think, to providers. Yeah. Um, what, one thing over the years that I have always appreciated is the uh, commitment of Wilmington to keep as many of our kids in district as possible. And we're, we're sort of focusing at the moment, because we all have budget on the mind, on some of the, the fiscal reasons for that. And certainly those, you know, that up to 14% um, <clears throat> increase in the out of district tuitions, it's going to blow a hole in a lot of budgets. Um, and so it's, there's a lot of consternation, you know, in districts throughout the throughout the Commonwealth. Um, but I think one other thing that's also worth emphasizing is that it's it, it not only saves us money, but it's much better for kids yep. to be educated right. in district when possible. And obviously, it's not always possible. We can't we don't have the capacity to do everything. There are kids who have needs that we can't meet, and that's why we have specialized private special education schools available um, for those students. But when we can meet their needs, it is much better for them to be educated in district and to be part of our community and to have the socialization and the social experiences um, of our school system. And, uh, and so it's, you know, the, 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 the financial aspect is an important piece of it, but it's also worth noting that, that this is much better for the kids as well. Um, yes. Under the caveat, I would argue, though, that we have to we have to fund it adequately. Like we have to have adequate staff to be able to do that. We have to have appropriate facilities and equipment. And and so I you know m my mind is sort of fast forwarding right now to like five or six, maybe maybe hopefully not seven years when we have a new Wildwood school 
that will be housing the majority of our strides programs and i think about what these classrooms really need mm -hmm. to really meet these kids needs because i've seen it i've worked in it i and it's they need a lot and i you know i worry about um you know the some of the you know the current situations that we're in and how are we doing and when people you know if people are questioning like do we really need a playground right now yes we need a playground we we need a lot of things and we need to really be thinking about um you know that it, it, this has big implications on our budget process and we really need to be thinking about what do um the programs need in order to meet this growing demand that we face because yes it i totally agree that educating these kids in district is is best as long as we are supporting it appropriately too mr turner to follow that i do have a general question about the msba program there are there are aspects of it that where the state has kind of guidelines <coughs> as to how you build buildings. And as we're a district that tries to keep as many students in district as possible, and some don't, does the MSC, MSBA program support the unique kinds of rooms that strides would need and those other sorts of programs need so that we can still maintain it? Or would we have a change where we might have to say, well, we don't have the right spaces? I, ideally, the new school is going to be much, much better for these things because it's much better spaces. And you can have an occupational therapy room that's built for the purpose, and you can do those things. Do, it, do you know what I mean? Cause what, like, as just a, as a silly example, MSBA has constraints on how big your auditorium can be, which right. is just the way it works. But does it support the way we like to have preferred as a town to do to provide special education? Well, I, I think at the at the <clears throat> at the foundational level, you know, uh, the building of a new elementary school today, no matter the district you're in, will simply um, will we'll simply be designed very, very differently to support more in intensive educational spaces. So that is to say, it's not going to be a cookie cutter. Every room is the same size, um, and you have to fit everything in. Um, I will admit, I'm not exactly sure. Certainly, the 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 uh, enrollment is a driving force for the overall configuration of the building, the sizing of the building. But um, MSBA does know that there are unique programs from EL uh, educational learning programs to uh, reading programs to occupational therapy and to these kind of programs that we're, we're highlighting here tonight that will be factors of into the d overall design. If, I don't know if you want to add. If, but if I could just add something. I know in, in when we did the high school, as we <coughs> move along in the MSBA process, there's times where we have to develop an educational profile, a special education profile, if you will, in what our schools the services our schools will provide. Mm -hmm. Now, where it goes, I know in the high school we, we did that. Yeah. Um, and it, it's part of the whole process. So I think as we right. go through the MSBA uh, process, we'll have to outline, you know, the type of programs we have. And, you know, especially if, it, you know, if one of the options is a consolidated school, it's the programs that are within those consolidated schools. Mm -hmm. and then kind of go from there. So, but I know that there's a couple of pretty big exercises that a district has to go through to explain to the MSBA what our profile is and, and why we need these sort of things, where it goes. Yeah. Is, but yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. I wasn't here for the high school, but no, the high school being built. But if I go into the high school now, we, there was clearly a couple of rooms that were designed for the student populations that are in them. Um, very large handicap accessible bathrooms with mm -hmm. changing tables like it they was. were designed that mm -hmm. way so I would anticipate we'd have some okay. certainly not my you know not exactly sure the process but clearly they did have a conversation with people that needed it thank you very much for this and thank we look forward for to seeing you at our thank next you. meeting thank you, thank you. Sure. Um, our next item of business is public comment Mr. Ragsdale all right. Uh, yep. Yeah, no, I'm good. Um, so we have uh, one person signed up for pub in-person public comment, Tracy Roy. And uh, 
as a reminder, please uh, state your name and address for the minutes and uh, limit your comment, please, to three minutes. To three minutes. Uh, Tracy Roy, 304 Woburn Street. I want to thank you, Dr. Brand and school board, for allowing me to speak today. Um, today I want to talk about a student need that is not being addressed, which is the health and safety of students in this district. Um, after hearing multiple comments tonight about COVID being over, I'm not going to bother reading my stats regarding it, um, but just know that it's not over for everybody. Um, so in addition to trying to mitigate COVID, there is also um, severe RSV outbreaks. Um, they're wreaking havoc on children of all ages, which is unprecedented. And we also have in this state overflown pediatric wards and children being uh, sent out of state for medical needs. Um, this is something that our school district should be taking seriously. Um, however, our school district includes a recorder module in the music program in the third grade in the winter during peak cold and flu season. Um, I want to bring to your attention that Dr. Adam Squalhe, resident physician and NIH T32 research fellow, suggests that musicians should be empowered to make their own decisions based on their individual risk tolerance, and leaders should be cautious in their representation of that risk. Our district is neither allowing for the assessment of individual risk tolerance, nor being cautious about its representation of risk by refusing to allow parents to opt out or fulfill this requirement in another meaningful way. Dr. Squalhay also found that inexperienced wind instrument players, such as third grade children, being introduced to a new instrument are more likely to have leakage of air and to work harder to produce sound, both of which have been found to create more risk of aerosol production and thus increase, increase the spread of COVID and other viruses. These particles have been found to fill practice rooms and may take hours to settle. These children are practicing in their primary classrooms. So now, after they put their recorders away, they're all sitting in a room of aerosols. Despite this being considered a high-risk activity for COVID and RSV spread, our district is requiring all third graders to be exposed to this elevated risk. Many people fought to have a choice in how they mitigate risk based on their unique situations. I support that. Our school district, on the other hand, is not allowing families in this community to have any choice. There are no alternative arrangements or programs available for families who are concerned with the spread of this virus and the long-term impacts it has on the human body. We are uncomfortable with that risk for reasons that is nobody's business but our own. We appreciate that other families are comfortable with the program and we support their standpoint, but we have not received that same support or appreciation from this district. I want to keep my child in public school, but I need to make sure she is safe. This district has made it clear that the safety of the children in our school district is not a priority, as they have been unwilling to seriously consider any of the several solutions I have proposed. The mission statement of our district is a school in community partnership that provides inclusive, respectful, and collaborative learning environment where all stakeholders are engaged in the development of the whole child. Yet, this has not been my experience. Instead, I have been met with nothing but resistance and unwillingness to find a suitable alternative. This district would rather fail a third grader then consider a reasonable alternative to fulfill this music requirement. I urge the school board to please consider the health and safety of its students and their families. Please find a safe alternative for families like mine so we can stay in public school, a human right that is guaranteed to all children in our country under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Thank you. Is there anyone else present who would like to make a public comment? Uh, the committee also received uh, <clears throat> several other written comments which we have reviewed prior to the meeting. A point of order? Sure. So and I, I very much respect and I certainly don't want to um, take away from um, Mrs. Roy's um, passionate speech. 
um, but I, I, I wanted to inquire that, um, and I think we digressed a little bit, I, that our public comments were supposed to be agenda-based public comment commentaries um, with regards to things that we're talking about at our meetings on, on this sense. And I, I didn't know um, if policy, if we've altered our policy or if we, if the policy committee is considering um, something other, but I, I, I say this with the most respect not to limit, but um, but because I think it's important to hear from families, um, but I, I, I do want to see that, you know, I do want to understand better that if that's our, our pol policy for public commons, I'd like to get back and fall into that policy again um, and uphold it and or have it reviewed by the policy subcom subcommittee because um, it's it's a point out of it's out of order. Okay. So I I'll say that re you. with the utmost respect and sure. uh, I'll bring that back. I'll forward that to the policy subcommittee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item of business is old business, and we're actually going to make a switch if that's okay. So I'm going to switch um, the school start time update proposal. Um, Lisa is here with us, and we figured we would reorganize that. Um, and then we'll do the Wildwood study options updates after. Is that okay with everybody? Great. Thank you. Good night, Alice. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for being here. Good night, Sola. Thank you very much. Tracy, could we um, switch to the start time presentation, Sorry about please? That, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> nice to see you, Lisa. You as well. Sorry, we're a little off our time stamp, so I apologize. That's okay. Okay, uh, thank you, um, and uh, thank you for the flexibility in uh, adjusting this. I know that you'll be up super early tomorrow, probably yes. behind <laughs> a wheel, so I, I appreciate that, and, and um, uh, certainly appreciate uh, uh, Ms. Fretter's time, uh, Ms. Ruggiero's time, Ms. Elliott's time, Mr. Turner's time, as we've continued to um, work, uh, work on this proposal, and, and pleased to be able to provide you with what I think is 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 an important uh, update on this important topic, um, and so tonight, uh, this presentation is included in the packet, and it, um, it 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 is all content that was included as part of the memo that uh, was provided to the committee and available for the community. So uh, through the presentation tonight, just a, again, sort of a because this is the first time in a, in a little bit of time that we've talked about this issue or this topic rather here, um, I thought to provide uh, some background reminder. Taking a look at the, um, the schedules as they are unfolding here and the proposed schedule as well as the current schedule, um, sort of break that new schedule proposal down uh, for you um, and then highlight some of the feedback opportunities and where we go next uh, as I see it in, in terms of options for, for you as a committee and us as, uh, as administration. So um, as some reminder here, you'll recall uh, that, um, you know, this for those that are tuning in, for those who are maybe moved into Wildwood and sort of wondering where this whole discussion of start time and the change of start time is coming from, um, it emerged as an important part of our strategic plan a number of years ago. Uh, you all know the, the story that unfortunately, um, as a result of the pandemic, uh, this particular uh, initiative got um, sidetracked and sidelined and some starts and some stop, no pun intended, uh, to, to get it to sort of a place to be able to really move it forward. Um, I will continue to thank the many, many folks who rolled up their sleeves and wanted to be a part of this committee effort, but that uh, certainly was impacted by the pandemic, and so we've had to take a, a divergent path to get here. The, um, uh, the discussion in May here in this room, uh, as you'll recall, had uh, uh, a robust uh, amount of data uh, and feedback from our community that came forward on the start time topic and the proposal of changing it, as well as a number of options. Um, and as you'll recall, uh, it really became fairly clear that we had a, uh, some degree of split uh, in the community, not necessarily one particular option that was embraced or um, uh, could be supported by all. And so as a committee, your request was to go back to take another look at the possibilities and to come back to you, which is where we are here tonight. Um, I think it's, a, again, worthwhile, very worthwhile noting. Um, and I know that um, I don't have to share this with Lisa. She's educated uh, myself and our team about this, but um, I think I can hit all of the salient points that, that she would share, and that is we have some real challenges here in Wilmington. Um, relative to trying to tinker or adjust to our start times. They include the number of schools that we have, 
They include the fact that we have to, um, Lisa has to design this model uh, to assume that all students can ride the bus if they wish to. And that is a, an, an important piece because of the fact that right now we do not um, ask families to contribute to that transportation service. And so uh, the default position is to assume that every single student we have in our school district has to have a seat effectively on a bus. Uh, and, um, and, and so those, those are important components, the geography, uh, the traffic patterns, all of those things play into this, but certainly the eight schools is a big, big piece. Five years from now, six years from now, if we are talking about a consolidated building, we're talking about a very, very different landscape and scenario. Um, so um, I think that uh, also as we get into this proposed um, new option, if you will, I think it's also um, uh, front and center important to point out that this does not include uh, any additional buses. Uh, we currently have 16 buses in the district uh, that we operate, that Lisa oversees and plans for um, every single day. Uh, that operation exceeds a million dollars that is supported by uh, your budget, the school district's budget. Um, and you will recall that uh, through the many options that were profiled last, last year, um, there were a number of them that included additional buses. And there is no, no question um, uh, that if we were talking about more buses, and this uh, undoubtedly may be some of your questions, and Lisa can expand upon this, but if we were talking about additional buses, the possibilities could be different here. Um, however, uh, you know, as, as, as an important piece to keep in mind here, uh, we are planning for an approximation of $75,000 for every additional, every bus that's added. Um, and as we will talk about more in uh, two weeks' time, when we are here discussing the budget for fiscal year 24, um, I, I can tell you as a committee that the, the, the idea of adding to our transportation budget as we prepare for what is absolutely going to be, uh, we believe, a very, very challenging year just does not even seem to be in any way a possibility. Um, perhaps a different year. Uh, there's a different sense of this, but going forward into next year, um, the out-of-district tuition costs uh, as one fundamental uh, component of that. Um, we'll talk more about that as the budget plan, but um, and you, you know, undoubtedly may have some questions about that. Um, and and there's another piece here, just to kind of throw this all into more of a uh, uh, a place of a new beginning, if you will, and that is time on learning. Um, that through, as you know, as a committee. Uh, with uh, your efforts and the administration's efforts in consultation um, uh, with the Wilmington Teachers Association, uh, we are adding instructional time to our school days across the board uh, for starting in uh, the next fall, the 2023-24 school year. And when we were developing the options uh, last year, uh, this additional time could not be factored into those scenarios for the simple reason that we had not finalized that. Um, uh, by the end of last year, by the end of June, I think it was, uh, when, we, when we finalized the contract with the WTA, uh, this was a very new uh, but important piece that impacts all of this. So, um, you know, again, all of this is information for those that are looking for a little bit more is it included in the memo if you're interested in, the, in following this, but um, I thought we'd sort of cut to right to what we what, we, what we're looking at here right now. This is the current schedule uh, in which we operate in the district. And the middle column, um, the middle column identifies the length of school days uh, across the board. And uh, on the far right hand column uh, is the translation of those uh, length of days to the start time and end time across the district. This next uh, this next slide provides a highlight of what the new length of school day will be starting in the fall of 2023. And, and so as an example, <clears throat> Wildwood right now, going back to the previous slide, and about, well, five hours and 15 minutes. We've expanded the time, uh, not the same across all levels, I should point out. Uh, more time is at the elementary level, uh, 15 minutes. Uh, whereas at the secondary level, uh, additional five minutes. But uh, what this slide shows is the length of the school day uh, in 2023. 
regardless of any decision that you as a committee might make to change the start times, this will be the length of school day in the fall as per the new contract that is in place. So again, if there's no, if there's no will or desire to change and uh, realign our start times uh, to support um, this effort to specifically change the uh, start times of our young adolescents, the adjusted schedule for the fall of 2023 with that additional instructional time is highlighted in the third column from the left. Um, and I'll let, I'll let uh, Lisa talk to this in, in just a little bit of a mo uh, moment. Well, actually, let me pause here. This might be a good place for you to jump in. Can you kind of take us through why it is that these, ch these times have to change in, in, in response to adding the time? Um, so what research showed it was ideal for the secondary education to start school between 8 and 8.30. Um, so that's our parameters, so I started there. Um, realistically, with our time on learning to push to an 8.30 start time, it was going to have an enormous uh, negative effect on athletics and after school curriculars for our secondary education students uh, with a closer to 3 o'clock out time. Uh, buses wouldn't be available till 3.30, if not slightly after that, for athletics. Games wouldn't start till at the earliest 5, some even later, depending on amount of time needed to warm up for the sport. Um, so with that parameter, we went, I went with the lower end, 8 a.m., uh, for the start time for the secondary and built from there. Um, with our North Woobin Wildwood side, um, that is our largest geographical area that we need to cover. Um, those routes take longer um, because the Shawshine side is a small fraction um, of that particular side of town. Um, right now, um, for instance, in the morning, the uh, time change between the Boutwell and the Wildwood, the buses are permitted 50 minutes to cross and cover the entire side of town and get back for Wildwood education. Um, and they do that um, effortlessly. We don't have a ton of play with time. We don't have a lot of room. It's getting done. Um, nobody's feeling rushed, um, but it but it it's tight. So. We kind of need essentially that 50 minute time frame. Uh, with that, if we put Wildwood um, closer to an existing time, like right now where it starts at, you know, almost 9 a.m., 8.50 a.m., if we put it there, the buses do not have enough time to cover that side of town and drop off at the school. Um, so we really want to push to start with that. Um, also, we currently use four Wildwood buses. With this particular time, I have all of the buses available because we're not aligned with any other schools. Um, in the existing model, we have high school routes in Shawshine West. So the students go in with Shawshine West and they leave with the high school students. So we're very limited on the amount of vehicles we can use for this particular school. But in the new model, I have all 16 vehicles essentially available. Um, so I have more than four available to cover Wildwood in this particular scenario, so we can make routes a little bit shorter. Um, Shawshine, again, with the transition um, from 8 a.m. to 8.25, we have a very small period of time. Um, it's not enough time to cover the north and Woburn side of town. So we want to stay on the Shawshine side, smaller geographical area um, that we can accomplish in the 20 minutes. Um, and essentially, I think I kind of covered all of them. So that's kind of why Woburn and North have been pushed to the last. So we're, we're going from currently in our existing model, we have one, two, three, four, six, six tiers, and we're dropping down to that fifth tier. Um, with high school and middle school going together at one particular time, based on our current registration system, uh, we do not need additional vehicles. Um, based on the no number of students that are registered at this time to utilize the bus. So that, that proposed schedule, um, again, captured in the memo, but highlighted here on that far right-hand column. Uh, I, I think, as I said in my memo, I, re I really believe after, um, after all of the, the time that, that you know, has been able to be spent sort of re-examining things and taking into consideration this extension of uh, the instructional day, Given the constraints that we have, I, I really do, we really believe this is the, 
this is the best that we can do uh, without adding more buses, given the constraints that we have, um, and, and trying to align to that eight o'clock hour as, as the feedback, the research point to uh, for, for our secondary level students. Um, it's certainly not perfect. Um, I, I think the one caveat in that, that statement that I just made, uh, as I highlighted in the memo, is that um, it, we, we absolutely do believe that it would be possible. This, the 740 hour for Wildwood is indeed, um, it reflects the largest change for any school from where we're at today. Um, and and I, I do want to acknowledge that completely. We can, we believe, if there's interest to align with this model or proposal, we can adjust that Wildwood time and push it ahead or back. I never know which way that is supposed to go. but. Uh, for example, say to 750 or some other uh, number with the understanding that everything else has to slide along with it. So if, if Wildwood is to be pushed closer to 8 o'clock, uh, it can be done. Uh, the very end of the day, if that's considered sort of one bookend, the very end of the day relative to when the high school would get out, I know the question will be, well, what about athletics? Uh, we have talked about that. We've thought about that. I've talked to Mr. Ingram. Uh, he also believes that there's the ability to get out and, and have students on the road 3 o'clock or a little bit after, and he's confident that that will be fine. Um, so we can adjust this, but the understanding that everything has to slide, uh, slide with it. So just to, and then certainly open up to more questions. So the highlights of the new proposed schedule. So there's, just to be clear here, what we believe to be one proposed schedule um, that takes into account all of, of, of what I highlighted and talked about. Um, when you take a look back at the uh, feedback um, that, uh, thanks to our partnership with, with PAWS last year and thanks to the over 1,000 community members, community residents and staff who took that survey last spring, if you consider this proposal, that proposal that I just mentioned, and take a look at the highlights of the feedback um, here, first off, to be clear, this is an entirely new proposal. So if someone was, has been paying attention to this conversation, uh, you will not find this proposal that's here before the committee in last year's uh, presentation. Uh, we really believe, after some the luxury of time to take a look at it, that it does align with really many of the top community priorities that were identified in, in the survey. Uh, it's indeed the case that no longer would it be necessary for any students to be picked up prior to 7 o'clock, any students in the district. Um, it does not, as Lisa said, require any additional buses. Uh, it does not impact in an adverse way athletics. It will certainly not impact CARES. That we, we, we loud and clear a, a concern around that and some of the other scenarios, some of the other proposals last year, as I'm sure you'll recall. I've had this conversation with Patty. We've, she's taken a look at this. She has seen these schedules. She understands the proposal. Uh, CARES would not be at risk here. Um, Seven of our eight schools are shifted less than 40 minutes if this were to be the proposal that would, were to be moved forward. And, uh, and seven of the eight schools would have their start time within the eight to nine o'clock hour. So maybe best to pause there. Um, and I'm not sure, Mr. Turner, Ms. Elliott, or anyone else, if you want to add to any of this. I know you've been partners in this, in this ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think you covered all of it. The, the main thing I would say is, is going back and looking at that survey, what were the parents' priorities? And this particular proposal aligns with all of the first five, six, seven of those priorities. And so I, I, I think with the review you did of the, of the ridership and truly getting the, the precise grasp on what was possible, bringing the high school and middle school together, um, <coughs> that, that this, this does meet the request. Obviously, nothing's going to be perfect with eight schools. I mean, that's that's clear. But it does meet the request. It meets the priorities, um, and and I, I I think it's a viable option for sure. Um, and and thank you. Uh, so the proposal um, states further down that the that middle school and high school students will be riding the same buses that they'll be added together. Yep. Um, if both schools are going to be starting at 8 o'clock, how is that going to? So in the morning, all schools have a 15-minute drop-off window. So um, 
students begin unloading 15 minutes prior to school starting. It's how we successfully go from the North and Movement Street to the Shawsheen West. Um, so with that being said, we're gonna see students starting to be dropped off at 7.45 for their eight o'clock start and the buses will have 15 minutes to cross over to the other school. Is there one in particular that will be I mean, is that just part of the routing that like the it, high school will go first and then the school Whatever's quickest, because um, the goal is certainly to have students out of bed as late as possible to keep routes as short um, as possible, similar to what we've done with the middle school. Um, we were able to raise the start time with that. So if a bus is coming from the north side of town, it's going to drop off the high school first and then head to the middle school. Um, if it's coming from the Shawsheen side, it's going to make the drop at the middle school and then head over to the high school. That's also going to help with traffic um, so we don't have 16 vehicles that are 40 feet long sitting on the bridge on 62 waiting to cross over. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, they will be kind of split up geographically depending on where they're coming from, who's going to make the drop first. And the same is going to go in the afternoon as well. So if a bus is crossing over to the north side of town, they may pick up the uh, middle school students first and then head over to the high school or vice versa. There's a five minute end time difference. Um, so it, it does mean that some, some of the buses will be about 10 minutes late after this pickup time, after the end of school, getting over there to pick up the students. Um, with this new schedule, is there any concern with any students in the district being on the buses for longer than 40, 45 minutes? Um, actually, no, not at all, because we're going to be using all 16 buses. It's no different than what our middle school students are doing now. Mm -hmm. um, so at our furthest point in town, um, which would be from the middle school, which would be the end of a street neighborhood, um, those students went from a 620 pickup time to a 645 pickup time. That's when the first students picked up, and they're on the board of the bus for uh, 30 minutes. Um, so we're looking at about a 30 minute time frame with the students but on board. I, I say that respectfully only because we're going later. So yep. traffic patterns can be heavier mm -hmm. during the times that we're doing pickup, which I'm, I'm, I'm only thinking that the traffic patterns in, the com in this community is a little bit heavier than, when, than mm. the six, you know what I mean? And I just, I, th I think, because <clears throat> I'm in absolute support of doing start times um, of, of moving forward with this, but. I just want to ensure that we're not going to, um, and I know there'll be a problem solving, there'll be tweaking along the way, but I, want to, I just want to make sure that there's, we consistently can get our students to school within that 15 minute window um, and picked up, you know what I mean, a accordingly without a absolutely. extended delays, especially the, the time of day. And traffic nowadays though too in this community, I mean, I've seen the change over my 20 years here, but. You know, that's just like a real, right, you know, it's just a real concern. I just want to make sure that um, we're set up in the in the perfect light to succeed. Yes. Um, so currently, and I know the middle school does start early, and as you said, um, you know, 8 o'clock, traffic patterns certainly change. Um, but right now, we have uh, the earliest drop-off at the middle school at 7.05 for the 7.20 start. Um, and I have buses rolling in. Whichever ones can roll in the latest, some drop at 7.15, five minutes before school starts, um, if the bus has the time to do so. Um, with that being said, in the 7.05 drop, they're still making their high school routes, um, which is very, very challenging because these buses are crossing all the way back over, oftentimes to the Andover Street side, Andover Line, and still making it to the high school in time um, at 7.40. So I think we're going to see some challenges the first couple of weeks, as we always do. Um, but it's certainly going to smooth itself out. Um, we have a lot of car riders in the first couple of weeks of school, um, which creates an enormous <laughs> traffic jam everywhere um, until everybody starts putting their students on the bus again. Um, obviously, during construction times, uh, just like we do now, we are going to experience some delays. Um, I do, I do think this can work. Um, we may have to make some tweaks here and there, but I do. Um, I also think high school students are going to get better service, um, so they'll get more closer service, because um, some of them just certainly do have to walk quite a little bit uh, to the bus stop. Um, so they're going to have closer service. Um, walk zones for high school students will still remain the way they are now. Um, 
and bus passes most certainly will be need to be used for both the high school and middle school routes specifically because there are students who are going to attend the middle school that don't qualify for transportation and high schoolers that do. So we need to be able to identify and make sure we keep those numbers very, very strict because we do not have a, a large amount of space on these vehicles to um, essentially just be taking walkers on a rainy day or you know something to that effect. So a bus pass system will most certainly have to be used um, for the secondary levels just to ensure we don't have anybody on the bus that shouldn't be there because we do not have the seats to accommodate. So um, just a couple more slides. Uh, so the next the next steps here, um, you know, as a, as a reminder uh, uh, for the committee and the community, um, start times does fall under uh, one of the school committee policies. So um, it, it is my thought, I guess, my recommendation that this would be ultimately a decision that, uh, as a committee, you would you would be asked to finalize. But with that said, in order to help sort of inform that final decision and a recommendation from uh, from myself. Uh, the thought here would be to take a little bit of a different approach than just that of a survey uh, and hold two community forums. Uh, one on December 21st from 6 to 7 here in the large group instruction room and that is of course prior to the December 21st regularly scheduled school committee. And then on uh, January the 18th um, also from 6 to 7 and again here um, just prior to the scheduled school committee meeting for that evening. Um, these forums would be open to any member of the community any students, um, any staff who might wish to come and share their their thoughts and feedback on the proposed uh, on the proposed option here to support a change in start times, and then, you know, in terms of the options, um, I, I see three right now um, ultimately, but um, I think uh, maybe uh, there could be four if you consider back to the ability to adjust that Wildwood time. First off. Uh, would be to uh, you know to approve the proposed ch change here um, in, in, uh, in in what's been presented here and that that would take effect in the 2023-24 school year so next fall um, option two would be to approve the proposed change um, but if it was felt based upon feed that feedback that families staff uh, students felt like more time was needed before what would be what would be a January recommendation for a January decision then I suppose a possibility could be to make that change but starting in 2024 2025 um, and then the third option uh, would be to not make any changes and to stick with the current schedule so the next steps um, again just to kind of highlight here uh, obviously we're here tonight for this presentation the forums on uh, uh, the proposal here, the timeline for four, two forums, December 21st, January 18th, uh, and then uh, on January 25th, uh, the thought would be uh, if you felt as a committee that you could make a final decision. Um, certainly it would be my, it is my thought to make sure that this is shared with our community at large. I know that many watch these meetings and follow the activity of your, your meetings here, but not everyone. Um, and. Uh, I've found another volunteer uh, to join me in um, the Wildcat Corner next <laughs> week, and we are going to. Uh, I had to twist an arm, but she's going to do it, and we're going to. We are going to uh, record something next Tuesday. I think it is on this, also to try and socialize this uh, with the community. So. Uh, Thank okay. You very much. Yep. Right. Thank you Thank for you. being here. Thank, Thank you, you very Lisa. much. Thank you. And thank you to the committee. I know it's been a tremendous amount of work and time and Absolutely. organization, so we, are, we appreciate that. Um, next, we will move to item A, which is the Wildwood Study Options Updates, Dr. Brand. And there is a slideshow for this. There is, yeah. Could you, do you have? Okay. I can find it on my flash drive, but you weren't going to do uh, it. Well, I think I'm because, no, you thought that, uh, I'll just walk through it. Um, that's fine. fine. We can look at the, um, yeah. the memo. But just uh, so we have this one, but we didn't have the last one, so I was just confused. Uh, sorry, I had it here, and where did it go? It. No, I know, but I, yeah. I, uh, I need it. Jeez, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Hold on. That's all right. While you're looking for that. 
Um, I'm just going to say a welcome to Audrey Lacan, who's our uh, high school representative, and um, sitting in to report back to, to the student body at the high school. And um, well, thank you for being here. This is, this is a change in, in how we've had our reps before, and there'll be more to come on that um, as far as having a bit more interaction with the, with the reps. But That's um, this came from actually the conference. Thank you that you had shared oh, with um, awesome. Mr. Gendron. Yes, oh wonderful, and, um, I'm glad you took part of that. Audrey was able to attend that, and so. Wonderful, good, I'm glad. So it's well, that makes me stuff, happy, thank I you for feel, participating. I never, never say hi to everybody, so hi, and thank you. <laughs> and you've been a very active participant in our meeting, and we appreciate that, so thank you so much for being here. Sorry, folks. Are you good it's my bad. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really. <laughs> I'm really not. Can you fill time for a second? <laughs> fill tap dance. You want know, my computer? Someone, someone filibuster. I have it on my flash drive. Oh my there you go. So, can we talk about how great Elf was? <laughs> <laughs> so. Fill time. Yeah. Mm. So I'm gonna. That Very means brief. quick. Yes. Here we go. Uh, it, there, it, it, thank you. Um, sorry. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Um, uh, yes, there are uh, four members of the community. Though. There are uh, items that are included in this packet and to provide you with an important update on another very, very important um, topic and project moving forward, and that is the Wildwood um, and the exploration of what uh, an interim solution would be. Um, at the Wildwood, the latest Wildwood Building Committee meeting, um, uh, the, this presentation was sh shared. And uh, just to quickly highlight um, where we're at with this, there are a number of challenges uh, I think that people know with the recent options uh, that were um, uh, were put together by our consultant Doran Whittier, and um, and with those options came a number of challenges that included a, overall costs to the town and to to the taxpayers as well as time to completion, um, and as well the. A potential disruption to grades and, and grade configuration across the district. Um, with that, uh, what emerged was the uh, recognition that we needed to circle back and explore another possibility. Uh, and that other possibility that um, was asked for some more time was to explore the possibility of including the middle school um, in alignment with the West. And so uh, at the, um, uh, th those are the, the challenges that uh, really emerged with at first the 16 top options and I think we went down to eight. Um, the consideration of the middle school again sort of is was not something that Doran Whittier was asked to look at or examine fundamentally because of the fact that it was uh, it is continues to be believed to, to not be physically designed in a way that could isolate the younger population just by its layout um, but in addition to that trying to meld an entire school of 12 classrooms and a whole lot of support staff uh, with the existing middle school, despite the fact that there's been the decline in enrollment over the years, uh, as we know, from a peak of over 900 to now hovering around six, uh, to uh, you know, knowing that facility well, the idea of integrating the entire Wildwood into that building uh, is, is far more difficult, and I would use the word, I think, impossible, uh, the, the impact of that. However, after further for consideration, the idea of using two sites instead of one, um, uh, while not ideal, emerged as something worthwhile to explore, and that's how that um, arose. And uh, you know, the, in, in the package, the, the, uh, the snapshot there, this came through with Doran Whittier's work to identify the fact that there is capacity at the middle school, and that there's no question of. There's capacity at the high school here too, uh, that there's no question of. But uh, Capacity on paper is one thing. The ability to appropriately carve out or identify space for a specific program is, is quite another. Um, so after some consultation with, with our team, with uh, the middle school administration, with, um, uh, with the Wildwood administration, uh, this is what is emerging as a proposed plan. Uh, and this plan would incorporate both the Wildwood, or include both the West as well as the middle school. Uh, and on this slide, and uh, you can see the, the proposal it's, as it stands right now, is that there would continue to be five classrooms at the West Intermediate School, of which there are five right now, um, and seven that would be coming from the Woburn Street and the Shaw Sheen would be, um, would be combined uh, at the middle school, will be combined at the middle school. Um, 
not necessarily those exact same classrooms, I do want to note that, but there will be a total of seven classrooms at the middle school. Uh, you can see the corresponding uh, population estimation there from a number of students' standpoint. Um, and really what emerged with further analysis was there is a section of the building at the, at the middle school in the lower level uh, that really, with this number of seven classrooms, as well as utilizing the library media space, we can create almost a small school within a school. Um, it is, of course, right across the street from the west. It's not under one roof, so it's certainly not ideal. But from many vantage points in terms of allowing staff to be closer together to really almost eliminating any staff travel to the different sites and, and, other, uh, and other benefits we see, it's, uh, I would argue, far better, far, far better than what we currently are, are relying upon the Wildwood staff to have to do. Um, this is uh, the highlight. It's a, I know it's a little bit hard to see here, but the lower level if you're looking at the facility the middle school from the street level this is on the far right hand side um, and really uh, that door 14 as it's called uh, or we're calling it I think it's numbered that is not exactly directly across the street from the front doors of the west but pretty close um, and 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 again it's understood in the elements and such it's not ideal if I'm a reading teacher or a certain teacher that may have to travel um, from one facility to the other. It's, but um, certainly the idea here is that students would not have to travel. Uh, now, with that being said, we still have some, we're at the, call it the 15,000 foot view of this and we've, we've figured out the plan of where to put them. There may be um, a, a desire to utilize the gymnasium at the west for the smaller students that may seem better than the middle school. We, we still have to explore that. but but. But certainly, by and large, students will stay in the facilities that they're in. Um, but there may be opportune times to bring the students also together if there's an assembly, if there, you know, those kind of things will pro certainly emerge as uh, opportunities that don't exist right now. So, um, you know, I, I think that there are a number of benefits with this plan. I won't go through them all here, but, you know, uh, really highlighting about, I think the centerpiece of this is bringing these, the, the staff uh, back together, the consolidation of resources, um, and, and, I, and certainly that front and center is staff, um, but other things as well too. Um, the other facet of this plan uh, that is being included is the construction of some sort of outdoor play space um, at the middle school, albeit temporary if you wish to call it that, um, because I don't imagine that once a new Wildwood school, whatever that looks like is brought online, we would, or the town would necessarily leave outdoor play space at the middle school. But there is the space to construct that area, or the area to construct that space at the middle school um, that uh, would, would be accessible uh, for, uh, for the years that the program would be there. Um, as everything often does, there are challenges. This, this also is not perfect. Um, and I highlighted the Wildwood staff. Um, by our estimations right now, and I will uh, want to underscore the point that it's still early in the overall analysis of where people will 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 go in the net or the the impact on the middle school staff um, but it is the case that we will have to ask for the uh, the support of a certain number of middle school staff that would have to travel from one classroom to the next uh, for their programming I think it would be a very small number um, but uh, th that is not the case right now at the middle school my understanding is that for the most part almost every educator has their own dedicated space certainly that's ideal but certainly that's the case that you, um, you know, there's lots of schools that we could quickly find in which there unfortunately are needed staff to travel. We have that right now uh, in our district in some, some locations. So uh, the cost is, this is something that's very active and very fluid literally as we speak. There have been a lot of, a uh, lot of time. Ken Lord's been a big uh, asset uh, working with Paul uh, the town and our consultant Doran Whittier. We have a follow-up meeting tomorrow, uh, in which we expect to get some um, pretty hard costs for uh, the playground as well as the restrooms. The restrooms is one facet that is being considered. I don't, won't go into detail here unless you have questions about that right now. But that's one limitation of the middle school that we have to adjust for. Um, and so there will be costs certainly with this plan, and those are being calculated. So we're sort of brings to the next steps. Uh, the Wildwood Building Committee, School Building Committee, is scheduled to meet next Tuesday. Uh, I think we're doing that virtually. Um, 
Again, that's a public uh, meeting for anyone who wishes to attend. Um, and the purpose of that meeting is to provide an update for that committee on the total costs of this project as we see them. Estimates as they will be, but, but closer to, to what we truly believe to be actual costs. The playground, the restrooms, and other things that are incorporated in this. The plan still is to ask that committee um, to make a final decision or a recommendation to you as a school committee on that. And then that would be coming to you uh, at your December 21st meeting, that recommendation rather. Um, and, uh, and that will include an estimation of the costs. And uh, you know the timeline here is being pushed, but it's being pushed in a, in a manner to try and get this total dollar value to the town manager uh, so that he can respectively plan his budget um, to incorporate or to plan for these, uh, these expenses. So um, happy to ask any questions you may have. Mrs. Burns. Um, quick question with regards to the restrooms. Um, is it that where those uh, classrooms are being proposed, are there not any restrooms on that side of the building? So that, uh, that facility has one set of student bathrooms on every floor. Okay. Um, and they're sizable bathrooms, and they're certainly appropriate for the population there, but they're not appropriate to have commingling of students of this different age level. Mm -hmm. And certainly you can find K-8 schools or pre-K-8 schools around the Commonwealth, you can find them, but um, absolutely what you would find is, is a different appropriation of bath or restroom spaces. So that's not present there, um, so they have to be constructed. Um, and that's what the consultants have been looking at, where best to put them for the least amount of money. Um, and That and would, I think, age appropriate. Part, well, that and be a part of I mean that's a, you, you're building a permanent, you're building a permanent addition, is, is what you're doing. Right. Well, it would be reconfiguration of internal space, so oh. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be an addition outside the building. It would be uh, seizing some portion of space somewhere near that lower level that we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just a, a, a comment of thanks to the group who's who's mm -hmm. done this work. I mean, for me personally, I think my, uh, the appeal of sort of renovating or retrofitting the Wildwood and putting staff back in there, uh, I was not a fan of. And so while I understand this is preliminary and there's a lot of work still to be done, this option feels significantly better to me than the others we'd explored. The, you know, the closeness of the staff, again, not in the same building, but the proximity, it just, I like this direction, so I'm excited to see what the the actual proposal looks like. So thank you. Um, to follow on to part of that, I, I do think that the, the benefit of, is clear of being that close. The amount of time staff are currently spending in their cars, not with children, is a, a significant problem educationally. Um, so a couple questions and concerns. One is the way the Wildwood's been placed in the West, and similarly, currently with Shawshine and, and, and um, Woburn Street, impacts those schools. So the, the bottom piece about anticipated costs, additional modifications to the West, I don't think should be underestimated. Um, and that, that if we're definitely saying for five more years-ish, there will be Wildwood students there, what we had to impact previously at the West should be definitely better accommodated so that we're not impacting the students who are in the West for those, those years. Um, the other side of it is, um, Right now, I understand from, from uh, Principal Bissell that, that occasionally students are walking to the Boutwell to use the, the playground there. Yes. It's a 45 minute exercise mm -hmm. to, to take the kids from there, walk them down the street and go there. And while it's critically important that kids get that extra t outdoor time, it is a long commitment of time. There are parts of the, the middle school plot that are almost as far from the West School as the Boutwell is. So if, depending on where that playground is placed at the middle school, it could be a significant amount of time to get the kids organized out back if it's on a far location in the middle school. So that leads to the question of a playground at the west, which could be a twofold benefit. One, be built to accommodate the five or six years of kindergarten pre-K children. But if it was done appropriately, could also finally fill the gap that's been at the west for years about not having a playground for the fourth and fifth graders. So that one could be a permanent structure or potentially a larger structure um, that spans the grades, but I think it should be considered that if we're doing this 
to help the wildwood. We're also impacting the West and to facilitate the, the proper physical activity of both age groups. Having a playground built at the West now as part of this proposal, I think would be really, really the right time to do it. it in theory, it could have, could have, would have, should have been done years ago, but it's, it's the right time to do that. And then the last thing is in terms of space, um, I understand that kindergarten classrooms require a lot more storage space than middle school classrooms. I think it's probably a material number to think about the additional cabinets that will need to be bought and put into the classrooms at the middle school to accommodate the stuff of kindergarten. So there's a lot of educational materials. Um, so I, I think that one should be added to the list of costs potentially as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Mrs. Carmen? I'm just on the heels of the special ed presentation, I'm, I'm still really thinking about that and I just want in the process of deciding I guess which classrooms will go if this is approved by this committee um, to think about which classrooms would be the appropriate ones to move and I'm thinking about the the proposed budget to add a Shawshin classroom which then funnels into the west and so I think you were saying mm -hmm. the West is potentially at some point going to need an additional strides classroom. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, just, I, I'm just sort of thinking about puzzle pieces and wanting to be, and I know you will, but be really thoughtful about which classrooms are selected to, to go into which building so that we are not asking <laughs> teachers to move again. Um, in that interim period. So I think it, we have to really think about and anticipate all of, all of that in this process. I think it's a, it, is a, it is a good thing to be concerned about and I think it, it, is, it can't be, you know, we can't predict the future, of course, but um, you know, we, we, are, we are up against the, 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 we're up against space constraints and, and moving, you know, and closing this building and, and yes, there is space to do this, but um, you know, if, if the question were to, ba you know, do we need to add another, what happens if we need to add another classroom at the Wildwood, where's that going to go? What happens if we have, so um, they're, 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 uh, I'm confident this plan can work, but if the future holds for a continual need to find space for some of these more intensive programs, we are going to have to think very, very carefully about where those are going to go, you know. Um, and 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 really assess that. So I think we are in a in a place where we just collectively, not just at this campus, not just because of this Wildwood move, but in general. And again, this goes back to the age of the facilities we're talking about. 1950s buildings do not have the space for some of these more intensive programs, and 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 so uh, we're going to have to be we're going to have to be very cautious in watching this as we go forward. Um, you know and and. This plan can work, but we will. Um, we have to make some changes at the West to to move a, middle, a music classroom out of the cafeteria. Uh, but but the West will be the West will be full. Uh, the Shashin will have a little bit of space freed up there by 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 removing a couple of classrooms, but not a lot. And the Woburn Street too. So. I just want to address for the community because I've been hearing and yet a lot of people have concerns about this proposal and um, sort of comments about it really being a primarily financially driven decision which is not true um, and a lot of questions about modular units still kind of floating around which I, I even asked at the last um, Wildwood building committee meeting and there's a, there is a shortage of that so time to completion is a really big deal. We want to right. try to situate teachers into classrooms in a more long-term, short-term scenario for next year. And modulars would not provide us that opportunity. So people need to really understand that. That's not the availability of modulars. Um, there's a shortage, you can't find them. Um, and so that is, that's, a, that's just a reality that we are contending with um, because I would love to have, to be able to consider that too, to address this space, space issue that we're sort of up against as well. But 
it's, it's the reality of, of what we're facing right now. Um, so, I mean, I appreciate this plan, and I think when I look at all the other proposals, this seems to be the a, a, a much better solution, but I'm curious about, like, the costs of it, you know, as it compares to the other ones. The other thing that I'm curious about um, is the impact on the middle school. Um, I know that uh, there's uh, moving the library uh, is one thing. What are the other impacts we foresee happening on the, on the middle school besides that? Yeah, so, so not, to, not to minimize it, and, and certainly not in a, you know, the, 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 what we're talking about here is the library media center, of course, as uh, was captured, and then these, right now, this plan for seven teachers. So, you know, um, but in addition to that, there's uh, some other moving parts that will, will, will be accompanying this, which we're still working on to flush that out. So to say that there won't be an impact on the middle school staff would be, would be incorrect. Um, there will be. But with, with the, the, the overall space, uh, square footage wise and, and classroom space in that facility, um, they are working hard, their team is working hard to sort of rethink that. Um, and that is inclusive of some, some of the smaller office spaces, of which there are other office spaces in the facility on the upper levels. Um, and then too, that domino of the, um, of the staff that I mentioned, that uh, it would be, uh, short-sighted to sit here and say that there won't be some teachers that will unfortunately have to probably share space, maybe need to move from space to space. So we're, we're you know, that's being looked at very carefully right now with the middle school staff. So, um, I, I, you know, I won't say that that's it. <laughs> uh, it's certainly, that's something and it's significant, but in terms of the access to the gymnasium, the auditorium, the other spaces, the ebb and flow of traffic or, or students. Um, you know, I think that the, the middle school can largely, will look and feel like it does today. Um, the start times, no matter what, whatever decision you're making as a committee around that, the wild would still have its own time. Uh, it will be separate from the middle school. So, uh, you know, the, there will be more traffic on that site for sure, but, you know, I think that it, uh, the two can coexist and the middle school can still be the middle school with teaching teams, the core teams as it knows it. Uh, we're working on a schedule, as you know, so that's just a parallel track here, um, but nothing because of this move if this happens here. Oh. Thank you. Mr. Turner, oh, sorry. But yes, I would like to, I would let David go first if you'd like. You guys figure it out. Come <laughs> <laughs> right. amongst yourselves. Uh, Boxes uh, of paper. Defer, defer. <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> I want to talk for just a minute about the bathroom construction. Um, I know this is something we haven't worked out all the details of, um, but I don't know anyone who's ever gone through a bathroom, even a bathroom renovation. Um, it's a you know it's a major thing, and if we're talking about actually constructing a new restroom from a place where there isn't any of the plumbing or any connections to septic. Uh, I mean that's that's major construction, yes. and you know, I, and it was mentioned in the presentation as one of the challenges about disruption of the middle school. Um, but it's like, yeah, I mean, like if you if you have serious, you know, major construction going on in that first floor, that is going to be highly disruptive. And I don't know if some of that can be pushed off towards the summer, but that oh. gets to be you know, presumably as much as possible. We would do that during the summer, summer but that gets dicey yeah. as well because that's you know it's like ten weeks, and then it's just like we got the start of school coming up. And so um, you have to be careful about that. But can you talk a little bit about some of the discussions um, that, that have been had with Dord Whittier? Uh, well, b better after tomorrow, to be honest, um, you know, in terms of their, they, ca they, you know, being in the work that they do and can look at a, a building, you know, certainly different than, than I can in terms of where the best possible space would be. Um, but wherever that space is, you know, I think you know, it will be a question of how the funds are secured, which is obviously Jeff Hall, you know, as town manager will be in the mix of that. If, um, I, But the construction that we're talking about here, and certainly my hope is, A, it's happening over the summer, and B, with this decision being formalized now, or call it, you know, in a couple of weeks, there can be all of the efforts with whomever's going to do that work uh, to be ready to go if it's July 1st or if it's, you know, hopefully earlier, not while well, school is in session, but to have it ready uh, to go. Um, the, really the restroom piece, I mean, work has been, uh, the library media center, uh, you know, 
that thoughts down to the details of movers and re relocating that. That's all in the works as well too. But that's again, I would say, uh, the advantage of this plan is that this can be, should be all ready to go for the start of school in the fall. So, and if I could, I don't want to, I don't want to repeat too much what other people have said and, and what I said at the Wadwood Building Committee meeting. Um, but I, I do want to also lend my, I don't know, not exactly concern, but we need to think about this. Obviously, this, this whole project is motivated by the fact that we have a school community without a school. And so we need to find, you know, we need to do right by the Wildwood students and staff and find a place for them to be and where they can be a school community. Um, but this is going to have major impacts on our other schools. And of course, it always has. The moment we spread them out to other buildings, we had host schools. And so I think we, it's very important that we really do think about this kind of holistically, that it's not just a matter of like, okay, this is the Wildwood solution. We have a three school, two building solution that we're working on here that's going to obviously, you know, very strongly impact the West and the middle school. And so, you know, thinking about the middle school, uh, you know, we have a lot of good momentum, I think, going on, that there's a lot of important work being done at the middle school. And people want to feel that that's not going to be interrupted and that their students are not going to be, you know, adversely impacted by, you know, by this, by this new system, this new plan that we're coming up with. Um, and, you know, and likewise at the West, that, you know, if they're for the next five years going to be hosting the Wildwood program, you know, we really need to think about what additional resources can we give them? Um, because, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be bearing burdens. Like, you know, the middle school in the West are going to be, you know, bearing burdens that some, that the other schools in the district are not. And so we need to both make sure that we do right by all of those students, um, but also um, just try to, you know, if they're bearing some of the burdens, then maybe we can also give them some benefits um, to counteract that. And, uh, and I want to just make sure that we're thinking about this um, as holistically as we can um, so that we, you know, everything is a trade-off, everything is to some extent a compromise, um, but really make sure that we are, and that people feel that we're doing all that we can, um, whether that's, again, like the playground over at the West, um, some of the other options that, uh, that we've talked about. Can I just jump in on that? Yeah, just because yeah, I, I yeah. think that's um, really important. And I, I, one way, I think, to do some of that is to make sure that we are involving the, the staff and the teachers in now some of what's going to be bits and pieces of, of managing that and right now I don't want it to feel very top down and then there's no sort of like ownership and investment and I want them to be a part of this to feel as though this is this is their decision as well in terms of what it looks like and who goes where and and how we can all kind of support what's happening as opposed to feeling like it's like that term burden like I don't want it to feel that way I, I know I know exactly what that means but I want it to feel like we're doing this in support of our, our Wildwood, but it also, what could the potential benefits be as well? I mean, I like to look at the glass half full, so I'm like, ooh, there could be this, and it would be really helpful for the middle schoolers to sort of see younger children. Like, I think there are some things that could come out of this that could be quite positive, that would right. be helpful for children of that age, and I know that I'm not gonna frame it all like that, because there are certainly other things that need to be thought of, but one way to do that is to just include the stakeholders in this work, and that includes the teachers, you know, other staff there, and of course families, and then the students. Like I would love to hear from middle schoolers about ways they could make the Wildwood students feel welcome there. And I just think there's some really interesting opportunities here um, that I hope we can all kind of rally around if, if this does wind up being the choice for Wildwood. Stephen. And I, I, I'm not gonna repeat but in terms of concerns Stay about here. yeah no I'm not, I'm not good because because you, you you've all Tracy made Tracy goes copy paste no. copy paste <laughs> you've all made different elements of the I concern about the I'm middle kidding. school but also the opportunity yeah um, and by the way you might want to put some soundproofing in between the cafeteria and where the wildwood would be because I hear the cafeteria and the middle school is a little loud um, <laughs> um, but then there's the one other small point and it's actually not a small one is some of these teachers will be asking them to move for a third summer or third time, March, and then some moved last summer, and some might have to move a third time. So we should, I would hope we'd consider the impact of them. Moving a kindergarten and pre-K classroom is a <coughs> lot of work. Days and days to pack it up and then set it up. And so that's something we should at least consider um, because that would be work they would need to do in June and or August when they might otherwise have other things to do, so. I appreciate all your comments. I think, you know, the, I think at the core of this, we need to also remember that we are going to, as a district, unfortunately, as a community, have to endure less than an ideal, ideal situation. This has, this has caught up with us, right? This, this has caught up with our community after, uh, you know, sort of 
this this lingering sort of reality here for this building. Um, and while not perfect, uh, you know, I think keeping in mind for a Wildwood or future Wildwood family that, uh, as well as our staff, that the instructional space arguably will be far, far greater in the middle school and, and in the West than otherwise would be uh, the case for the learning environment at the Wildwood, uh, as well as for our staff. And so this is, you know, it's going to be a little painful at times. We're going to have to readjust, certainly, and it, you know, it's, it's a long-term temporary um, but I know I keep telling myself this is a lot of work to get to, and we're not even there yet, but far better of a learning space and workspace for our staff and for our families than otherwise returning to the Wildwood. So. And then just a simple you know, gratitude to, to everybody involved in this work. I know that these particular meetings, but then the teachers and the staff and people who have been doing this work and moving in and out, I just can't express enough just how how wonderful people have been about trying to, to do our best for the Wildwood. And so, so we are grateful and I hope that as we move forward, it, it feels less like a burden, although I know there will be components of that and, and more like we're actually, there's a plan in place that's going to be beyond just a few months. I mean, I think this moment to moment can be so trying for teachers and staff and students that where, where are we gonna be next? So I'm hopeful that at least knowing a little bit of the advance will be helpful to, to our teachers. MJ and oh, I don't know who's. When, I think he had his hand. Oh, okay. Up. Go ahead. Um, I, I just want to add, add one more thought, which is I hope that this is something that we, because we can end, this is a you know, short term, long term. I mean, we're talking about you know, five years, probably minimum, uh, of doing this. I hope that this is something that we continually think about and revisit, uh, that the options that we have right now are not necessarily the only options we'll ever have over the course of these five years. And there's a tendency, of course, in a lot of organizations to kind of, you know, do something and then kind of just wash your hands of it and be like, well, you know, we did that, and then you kind of never look at it again. And I think it's something that we want to be coming back to and thinking about, do we have other options now, even if it's just that, well, you know, we spent a little money, you know, on it this year, and now we can spend a little more money in next year's budget, and some money in next year's budget, and make this something that we continually try to improve and not just say, well, this is our solution, it's a one-time thing, and then never touch it again. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I missed it. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. I'm here. I thought it was steeple in my mind. I was like, Mr. Trent, and then I realized it would have been you. Sorry, Mrs. Burns. Not this time. <laughs> Weird. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting punchy. Um, I, I do want to say that this, yes, it, it, it'll be difficult. It's a transition, and it's, um, it's a temporary, yeah, but I think... Um, not to be uh, idealistic, but this will be a true test to our school communities, and it's about um, bridging that support. It's just as difficult for our, our Wildwood staff. I think we're, it's, it's a, a benefit that you've touched upon to go into the middle school, and it's not their, it's, it's not their realm, you know? It's not their space, um, but I think it's, it's, it would be, it's a good lesson in practice of, of, of of, of community at its best. Um, you know, it's everyone I think it carries a certain, um, I, I have to agree with you, Mrs. Bryce, when you say that you don't like the, to use the word burden because um, it's, I, I like to say challenge. I, I think maybe perhaps that might be, um, be but, but I, get, I get it. But you know, it's about problem solving together and collaboratively. Um, and even though, you know, you've got two different grades and ages, it's about coming together and trying to support one another in this transition, in this temporary, permanent scenario. Um, and, um, and I'm going on your glass half full. Um, I, I do think, um, I, I think we, as, as we've always have, um, can um, navigate through it. Um, and to, to make it, because I think we have to, to make it for the best experience for our students and their learning um, opportunities. And so I, I, I do have a lot of faith in our staff that we'll find, it's like a family, you'll, you'll find your, you'll have your tips, but you'll, you'll come together for the, for the greater good and for the, and the right reason. And I, I, I know that, uh, I do have faith that this will, this will all transpire, you know, well. I look forward to hearing about your next meeting. And um, what's that? This Tuesday. And then you are meeting with um, Dora Whittier tomorrow, is that yes. right? Yes. Yep. So there'll be even more information coming 
at our next meeting. Great. That brings us to subcommittee reports. Yes. Yes. Um, I've got two. I'm going to do the, the, the short one first because it's easy. They are uploaded on the I saw. Board. Thank you so much. So um, just to let you know, um, I'm not sure who may be on the, um, the email list for MASE that um, the president-elect for 2023, Stacey Rizzo, did send out um, information um, about uh, committee equipment requests. Anybody who's interested, I think I, I talked about it uh, after um, conference about some of the, the committees that MASC has that if anyone has any interest um, to fill out the application form, the request form, and submit it. Um, and then the wellness, uh, the school wellness advisory committee met uh, last Tuesday. Um, some of the updates from it is that um, on the food services piece, um, Mary Palin uh, attended the fall SNA conference that focused on um, scratch cooking from scratch. Um, and she also went to the leadership retreat, which uh, focused specifically on staff retention, the shortages in labor um, and supply issues uh, facing um, districts. Um, she also uh, made note of the gobble gobble day um, that where the administration, um, I think, were serving lunches to students, if I'm correct. Um, uh, so that, that was some of the items. Um, and something mindful that really kind of struck me, because you're right, we're all in that budget season is that um, she did, um, she did, um, she wasn't present, but she did send um, uh, notes about how um, the cost of like fresh produce currently um, and, and the, the uh, difficulty in getting uh, fresh produce uh, with between deliveries and transportation uh, issues um, that a case of romaine lettuce went from $48 per case to 110 per case. So just uh, to keep that in perspective, when we, we see all that Mary and her team does for students to um, making sure our students have the best opportunities for um, healthy lunches, uh, just something to be mindful of when, when you know, um, the cost of the, the food uh, that comes into our districts um, uh, and the increased costs. Um, but anyway, uh, moving forward, um, we were uh, hopeful, um, Laura Stinson and um, was hopefully uh, hoping, hopefully hoping, excuse me, um, to pilot a, uh, a, a curriculum um, for um, pre-K through, uh, I think, kindergarten grades, um, which looked quite interesting and I think quite fascinating, but with everything that's going on within our district right now with the Wildwood transitioning, um, the buildings and all this, um, all these uh, areas, um, they've decided to put it on hold in order to give it a really viable opportunity. Um, they don't want to overburden the teachers with uh, piloting a new curriculum. So, and um, after discussion members thought that, um, that the MARC program is in its beginning, of its rollout phase and that with um, the schools completing those required lessons, um, I, you know, the teachers have already a, enough on their plate to focus on um, for success. So that, that will be probably coming out hopefully in the next, um, not the upcoming school year, but the following after that. Um, the school nurses at the North and West are developing a new growth and development program um, that they'll present to students. Um, at future meetings, uh, they're looking at aspects of videos and things to bring forth to um, our younger generation about, um, how do I put it, uh, growth and development programs and maturity and body changes, um, things of that sort. Um, Ms. Stinson also uh, uh, let us know that there will be new frameworks uh, coming out in the spring uh, from DESE um, that will uh, create new comprehensive health curriculum frameworks so that public comment will be coming out so that there'll be um, changes in PE curriculum uh, soon after. Shelley Newhouse did discuss, uh, we had a discussion about the flu COVID RSV cases currently in Wilmington um, and the interesting data regarding um, the number of people coming in for COVID boosted uh, shots. Um, the numbers, I guess, increase with the age of, of folks. And if there's anybody interested, um, I told her I would, let everyone know that her office will be having another booster clinic at the town hall on December 19th 
from one to three. Um, it should be on the website if it's not already there, uh, if it's not there, but um, uh, there'll be reminders and links that should be going out to families. Um, so if anybody, um, anybody can go. You can be a resident in Wilmington, but she'll vaccinate anybody you can get in. But um, so that's, that's pretty much in a nutshell, but thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Um, there's also a subcommittee report from the Finance and Budget Subcommittee that you can take a look at. Um, Stephen, did you want to say anything else about that? Very, very short and to the point. We've had three meetings. We've met each time with a representative of the Finance Committee from town to help keep them in the loop. Particularly, we've gone through and touched on special education at the high level, um, the, the um, state, state approved increases for spe specifically for out of district placements, and then they, the other major drivers for the, the budget this coming year and, and potential changes and increases. Um. Thank you so much. Um, anything else? Co subcommittees? Correspondence? None this evening. Okay, so future, future school committee dates we have December 21st, 7 p.m. Um, we'll have the forum ahead of time at 6 p.m. And so we're not, I'm not exactly, I'm going to think about how we'll structure that is whether or not that'll just be. Sure. The committee, the school start time committee, who's sort of managing that, and then we'll just be here to listen. You know, but a, a forum means there'll be some Q and A. Um, so we'll talk what that's going to look like. But of course, all school committee members are invited. I don't know if we'll all be participating, but we're all invited, um, and that will happen at six o'clock. And then I believe there are some subcommittee groups meeting at five o'clock. So very busy. Groups. <laughs> uh, January eighteenth is the first meeting in 2023 at 7 p.m. I'm sure there'll be lots of other things around that meeting, but for now that's all. Um, there are some upcoming performances, I think, happening, so just take a look at the website. We know we have band tomorrow night. Um, we have chorus. And on the district calendar. District right? calendar. Band tomorrow night. Chorus was last night. Um, so strings, strings is, on is the next tenth week. And seven, there's one, one on the 10th and one on the 17th, I believe. But double lots, check the district calendar. Lots of opportunities. <laughs> To come and, and hear and see our students. And thank you all. Um, so many of us attended Elephants. So that was great. So thanks. It's great to see you all there. And I think that's it. So if there's nothing else, just a motion to adjourn. Mrs. So Plowman, seconded by Mr. Fennelly. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.